Happy New Year's Eve and welcome to a special edition of the Department of Tangents podcast, a look back at the year in horror films with filmmakers, musicians, and writers Michael J. Epstein and Sophia Cassiola, who released their own horror film in 2018 called Clickbait. We talked about the best, the most disappointing, and a few mixed reviews, including bigger releases like Hereditary, A Quiet Place, Halloween, Sorry to Bother You, The Suspiria Remake, Annihilation, and Mandy, as well as some indie releases like the Kane Hodder documentary To Hell and Back, the video game themed live scream, and the generically named horror movie A Low Budget Nightmare. We also discussed some larger questions about the genre, whether we're in a horror boom at the moment and why there's still a stigma involved in calling your work horror. Mike and Sophia have no qualms with the term, which you already know if you listen to episode 5 of the podcast when they discussed the Hammer-esque film Blood of the Tribbids. They believe the term applies to their latest, Clickbait, which is about a viral video star who is stalked by a killer, but the movie is also a comedy and a satire with a wonderful through line of commercial parodies for the radioactive toaster pastry called Toot Strudels. Epstein mentioned a term he quite likes that is found more often in the European film world, cinema fantastique, which implies a kind of wild spectacle. And if you love the idea of Toot Strudels, you can actually buy t-shirts emblazoned with three different flavors on Amazon. Stick around after the conversation for this week's featured track from Whispering Sons, a band out of Brussels, a pulsing gothic rocker called Alone from their LP Image, which dropped in October. One note about this episode, it was supposed to come out several weeks ago, but I was knocked out of commission for most of December with an illness. I'm on the men now, and new episodes are on the way, but there will be another short break of a couple of weeks before the show picks up again. I want to thank you for your patience and wish you a happy and healthy new year. I'll be back soon with more music, comedy, and horror to inform and delight you, including several episodes I recorded at this year's Northeast Comic Con and Collectibles Extravaganza. Until then, here's Michael J. Epstein and Sophia Cassiola discussing the year in horror films and their own wonderful film, Clickbait. So do you think we're in a, a horror boom uh, in film and television and, and literature the way some people uh, seem to think we are? I think it's uh, the, the reason people say that is mostly because there are one or two sort of big hits that just happened to occur this year. Mm -hmm. um, and I, a lot of it, I don't know, I, I, I feel like a lot of it just centers around marketing. And so somebody, you know, some studio decided to heavily market a few horror films and that kind of led to successes in those areas. And then everybody says, oh, we got to make horror. Horror's in now. It's a, it's a big thing. But I'm not really sure that it's. Well, I think a few years ago, you couldn't even call your horror movie a horror because people wouldn't watch it. So everybody was like, it's a thriller psychological and now there's this term being thrown around called elevated horror which i think is crap because like horror <laughs> has always had subtext and things to say at least good horror and you know not everything it's just like people apart for no reason so you know like i hear this term elevated horror which really bugs me but it's like you've been going around it's like oh this is like smart horror or it's like in your brain you know it's three roll so that's been happening i think also yeah. Even though these horrors are maybe more like some of the 70s stuff where it's like they have a political or a social thing to say. Yeah. And, and actually, like if you're in the if you're embedded in the sort of horror community or horror world, some of the biggest hits this year uh, uh, for smaller films are things that are I would without I think by design, not really intelligent at all. I, I don't mm. I don't think the filmmakers who made them would disagree like uh a film like um, Terrifier, which I have not actually watched, uh, I think it's unapologetically like not a film about anything. Oh, it's I've seen it. It's it's not. Yeah. It does have uh, an, an incredibly menacing uh, yeah. baddie in it who who was great for about maybe thirty thirty five minutes of the film, and then it just turned into kind of a slasher, this year standard yeah. slasher yeah. film. Yeah, so I have, I mean, I have nothing, I'm not really critical of it or, or anything. I'm just saying that, you know, horror means a lot of different things. Yeah. 
mm-hmm. to a lot of different when people are like, I don't like horror, I'm like, well, you're probably just thinking of one subgenre. <laughs> right. <laughs> there's much that falls under that umbrella. <laughs> well, yeah, and when you ask them, well, okay, did you like Get Out? And they'll say, well, that's not really horror. Did you like Something <laughs> Wicked This Way Comes? Well, that's not really horror. Did you like Silence of the Lambs? Well, that's not really horror. That's a thriller. Right. Yeah. Thriller. Jaws. That's all horror. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I tend to cast a much wider net in what I describe as horror than than, uh, than some people as well. Like to me, Time Bandits is a horror film. It definitely scared me. Uh, I would say Time Bandits, as a kid, was one of the scariest films I've ever seen because, especially because of the ending. I mean, I, I guess it, it's however many years, so I can't have to spoil it. I worry about spoiling it for people. But, <laughs> right. uh, but I mean, the, the the kid's parents explode at the end. It's not really. I guess it's not really even plot driven. But um, yeah, that the the was it, is it called what's the darkness or the black or the it's nothing? The, what was that thing called? The most evil, the most concentrated yeah. evil in the universe, and it's in their toaster oven. Yep, and they touch it and explode. And that I will tell you, when you're seven or whatever age I was when I saw that, it is an unpleasant. Uh, thing because you're like wait they can't his parents can't be dead at the end of this movie because i've never i don't know i've probably never seen a movie where there was like an unhappy ending well then it backs out basically into the universe and goes and you know flits away well that's yeah. the, the message there is you are insignificant <laughs> thanks to you know and i got you get that even if you're seven eight years old so i've had existential horror uh since i was a young child all because of time bandits uh, I could agree with that. I under horror as well. You know, all the post-apocalyptic. We've been watching a lot of uh, like invasion of the body snatchers type movies, which are like pretty horrific. You know? They're horror. They're horror. Yeah, yeah. Like body and stuff, but it's like it falls under sci-fi. But like yeah. those are my favorites. Like I kind of like I, in a lot of the European, at least in film festivals. I don't know what the sort of standard in in society is, but in the film festival world in Europe. They just have a, a an idea, the fantastic idea, where it's just, it's about like non-realism and about fantasy and about things that are representative or visual metaphor and are not necessarily realistic. And that can mm-hmm. be anything from, you know, horror to sci-fi to action to, uh, you know, even just just Im- sort of imagination driven films and I, I like that as an idea of like that to me is is the genre I'm interested in so it's not really about the specific content but it's about the idea that you're using film as a way to look at something that's not real realism mm-hmm. I could agree with that I could uh, I could get behind that I, I do wish that that horror wouldn't have necessarily the stigma that it has sometimes yeah I, that seems it's cyclical too that seems like you know horror until you know rosemary's baby and you know some of the movies in the the 70s i would include the stepford wives in that because yeah, yeah because get out is heavily heavily influenced by the stepford wives as well it seems like it's you know once a decade we have we we come back to this yeah, I think it's, I mean, it's partly that once something is popular, and I think we'll we'll see this emerging in the next few years, may, maybe, maybe not, but uh, once something is kind of popular or, or people, execs in a, in a boardroom are, are like, well, horror is the end thing, they just start cranking out stuff without really understanding what the thing is that made it good in the first place. They're mm-hmm. just like, well... Copy that. I think that it really happened with slashers, and maybe that was a big problem for horror in the in the eighties, especially, where we had. Uh, I mean, I think like Black Christmas is a fantastic movie. Uh, Halloween is a fantastic movie, and then pretty much everything after that, you're just copying that model. And mm-hmm. I'm not a big Friday the Thirteenth fan. I don't think those are very. Um, I don't think they're particularly good. And I think honestly, Sean Cunningham, if you if you listen to him talk about it. He was like, I don't know, I needed to feed my family, so I needed to make a movie that, that made some money, and I saw that Halloween did really well, so I figured uh, I should make one of those. Um, I, don't, you know, I don't think that anybody making it really thought, like, this is great art. Uh, so, you know, you had Friday the 13th, which is already a copy of a thing, and then, you know, you had a million movies that are uh, d- decreasing in, in care about what they're making, 
Uh, and so people, you know, came to understand horror is like, oh, it's this this bunch of knockoffs of slashers, like mm-hmm. third generation slashers. And so it's easy to understand why they were like, oh, horror movies aren't smart or interesting or, or you know, worth anything other than the thrill ride, some kind of crank out yeah. <laughs> nonsense. Um, so I think that happened. And I, you know, I don't know, maybe it will happen again. Maybe it won't. It's hard. It's hard to say. But uh, but yeah, I think that's part of the cycles that something good comes out and then everybody tries to imitate it. Uh-huh. And the imitations are bad. We, we always, you know, because we, as you know, we come from music for anybody who is not aware of that. So we always talk about it as like the silver chair phenomenon. We're like, <laughs> uh-huh. you know, Nirvana is a good band, and then you have Silverchair, and maybe like Silverchair is okay, I guess. I don't, I don't know. But then you have like the bands who are influenced by Silverchair, <laughs> and like <laughs> bands are influenced by the bands who are influenced by Silverchair, and you're like, you know, you get you get carbon copied uh, eight, eight generations away from the thing, and uh, and at that point, you know, it's not even, I don't even know what it is at that at that point. It's nothing that you you want to experience. Uh-huh. So I think that happens in film as well. Are you a, uh, a a Joe Bob Briggs fan at all? Uh, casual, I would say, but I think it's cool that that he's come back and and uh, we watched a little bit of some of that stuff, and I'm very excited because the Christmas one was all the Phantasm movies, right? Yeah, uh, which I have not. Uh, we haven't watched that yet, but I uh, Phantasm is is my favorite. I would say my favorite horror franchise, so I'm excited to sit down and and watch that. I, I'm still working on the Thanksgiving one and. Uh, the Hills Have Eyes is one of the uh, the movies in that, uh, one of the four movies he does for the yeah. Thanksgiving sequence. And he talks a lot about how Wes Craven just sort of uh, shamelessly ripped off Texas Chainsaw Massacre for that. Sure. To the point of using some of the same body parts that were props <laughs> in, the, in, the, uh, in the other film. Apparently he was trying to avoid having to make porn again yeah yeah i've heard that i've heard the story so what <laughs> yes. and, and yeah. so they said you know write something write horror and write give me something in the desert and that and the hills have eyes is what he came up with yeah because he did the last house on the left before that right yeah that was the first yeah. film and the hills have yeah. eyes was the second right because that was it was a slow rolling hit but it was a hit you know uh uh last house on the left and i think that he was working that sean cunningham did that with him and um you know, I think both those guys were just kind of like, well, we got to make money, so we, we you know, got to figure this out. And Wes Craven, obviously, I mean, I'm I'm a big Wes Craven fan in in general, not necessarily Last House on the Left or Hills Have Eyes that much, but um, but I think you know, at some point he did start writing really smart films. I mean, Nightmare on Elm Street right. is a great great franchise, and we just saw a screening of um, uh, Rainbow and the Serpent, which is a bizarre and interesting movie. It's crazy. Yeah. But that was a fun one too. And he so he did a lot of he made a lot of interesting films. I think. I haven't seen that one in a while. I need to go back. And the watch Serpent it. in the Rain. I said the name backwards, but you know you know what I'm talking about. It yes. falls into a weird genre of like voodoo being like a thing. <laughs> yeah, right. in era. It was just like a little problematic, but it was still like they went to Haiti and filmed and like and cast a bunch of locals as extras, and so it was like. I don't know, it was interesting for sure. And like one of the actors was at the screening we were at and they were like, Yep, we just filmed what they were doing. <laughs> yeah. like, I don't know how true that is, but it was really fascinating. Well, there has to be a victim in horror. So it's kind of a, a it's a, it's easy, I would think, to slip into being exploitive. Yeah. Sure, yeah. Well, especially with something mysterious like that, like the, the human zombies and that whole. Well, it's also, it's also like fascination with other cultures. You always have right. the like, like it's the otherism of it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but it's an interesting movie, anyway. I mean, it's like that James Bond movie is like oh, yeah. the most recent movie. <laughs> 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 Live, <laughs> is that Live and Let Die? Seymour. So how much yeah. can you hate it? But <laughs> is that Live and Let Die? I don't remember I think the names of yeah. James Bond movies. I cannot keep them sorted. Right. Yeah. yeah. It's a great movie, even though it is it is racist. <laughs> just, but you yeah. Can't, yeah, it's hard it's to watch. Great movie, even though it is racist. A little racist. Because well, I, mean, uh, I love the guy with the claw hand. I, now we're now we're on <laughs> tangent, but uh, Tihi, the villain in that one, Tihi, uh-huh. he has the claw hand. Oh, it's kind of a great a great henchman guy. Anyway, sorry. Well, no, it's it brings up an interesting point though. I mean, uh, when when you're part of of how horror works is to explore 
something you you don't know enough about, so you're afraid of it. Right. So exactly. when that becomes cultural, that can start to get real sticky unless you you've really got a handle on what, what you're doing and you've really got a, a, a strong narrative and characters to sort of play that out. Yeah. Right. And are you being respectful? Probably not. Maybe now. It, like I don't know. I always complain that filmmakers now don't pay enough attention to like giving women agency or like exploring like if they're going to do something like that understanding what they're doing like they're, I don't know I feel like we make a lot of the same mistakes that we used to make in the 80s and it's like why are we still making these mistakes when we should know better yep. <laughs> the, the culture well where do you fall on the final girl trope then because that that's something that some people have said it is you know sort of a feminist ideal and other people have sort of disagreed with that saying it's sort of that's exploitive in its own way. I mean, I think I can see both sides of that, but you know, one of the things I always say is we need to overreact to like set a basis and just seeing women kick ass and like survive and like go head to head with something. is still cool. I think uh -huh. <laughs> it, it feels a little tired to me. Too. Yeah. At this it's point, it's kind of like, all right, I get it. You know, we're like, okay, that's the one she's going to fight. Okay. She's going to do the thing. You know, she's kind of meek in the beginning and, I mean, it's yeah, it's almost on a per movie basis as to how much I enjoy it. Yeah. Uh, well, that's. I'm not a, sure. Yeah. Oh, I was just gonna say I'm not sure it accomplishes a lot. Like, what is it actually trying to? I mean, I. It's well, you're fine. not trying to like, especially in the '80s, they weren't trying to be like women to kick ass. They're like, yeah. here's this girl. We're gonna show her boob. She's gonna cry, and then she's just gonna win. You know, like. Well, and it turns out there's a big market for that. Yeah. Right. <laughs> I mean, I, don't get me wrong. I watched that movie many mm -hmm. times. I've seen that movie 500 right. times. I've seen it a few times this week, even. That's why but. I, I think when we watch a lot of, like, 1970s Italian horror, and so many of them, like, the women are, like, the main point of the story, and they think, and they have conversations, and it's uh -huh. like, so they do still do, like, the boobs and the screaming. It's, like, <laughs> super interesting to me, because, like, they really invest in their characters, and, like, they aren't, I don't even think they're doing it to be, like, they're certainly not doing it to be feminist, but it kind of, like, I call it, like, accidental feminism, where, like, uh -huh. give these women this agency, and I think it's just, like, they're, like, we like looking at women, so, like, let's make them the main character, you know? Well, your last <laughs> film was heavily influenced by the Hammer films, correct? Uh, oh, yeah. Blood yeah. of the Tribbets was, yeah. for sure. Yeah. 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 So I think when you, like, let women be a real character that do stuff and, like, you know, like move the plot. Like, I think you're going in a good direction. Mm. I, I didn't want to start with your disappointment list, but but this brings up uh, <laughs> a, a movie uh, that that had some of these elements to it, and that's the the new Halloween movie. Uh, and that that you we uh, sort of yeah looked at a, a a few movies before we started this, just so I could uh, have a thread to go on. My I liked the movie. I know it's on your disappointment list. The one thing I think that it didn't do quite as well uh, is bring together those three generations uh, of women yeah. that, that Michael Myers was terrorizing. I think it was a very frustrating movie uh, because it had a lot of potential to be really interesting and good, but I think it just didn't really know what it was trying to say. And I felt like it had a thousand characters. It would just introduce new characters and then kill them off. It didn't. It just felt like it was not really cohesive for me. Um, and I, I'm a big fan of the Halloween franchise in general, and even the bad Halloween movies I kind of enjoy, except for really I don't enjoy Resurrection very much. But I think uh -huh. every other every other Halloween movie of that main you know sort of franchise. I've actually not seen the Rob Zombie ones. I know that's a, that's a I, we we have them on Blu-ray, but I haven't watched them ever. Mm -hmm. uh, which I I guess I should. Uh, every movie in that you know one through six um, and H two O, I like. I think they're all you know relatively have something in them that's worthwhile. Some of them are worse than others for sure. And I felt like the new one just uh, didn't really know where to go with the story. It tried to set up. I you know I like. I like Jamie Lee Curtis in it. I thought she was good. Yeah. I felt like it was confusing what they were trying to say with her because, you know, her, her trauma and her, I, it was just a very confusing subtext about her. And I didn't really like, they would introduce all the teenagers, which didn't really seem to have anything to do with the plot of mm -hmm. the movie in any way. 
I really didn't like the opening with the the bloggers. I felt like that was kind of a weak lead in to the story. I didn't uh, mind them being involved. I didn't. There were certain elements, and and we're not going to be able to avoid spoilers and really talk about these movies. But the the uh, the point where they're shaking the mask at him at the hospital, yeah. I thought was silly, and the idea of him escaping the prison transfer was kind of kind of hacky. I enjoyed yeah. once he got rolling, the sort of relentless horror machine that he was. But there, there. I think there were some missed opportunities in the ending there yeah. for for all three generations of women to work together against it because yeah. that really only That's happened. Nice that. Yeah, it's really not. They don't really do well with those characters. They don't really establish the characters well. I mean, they spend so much time. I, I it, the way I described it is, it felt like a bunch of people made ten minute fan films that they just like stuck together as one movie. Mm. So there'd be like that scene with the babysitter uh, and the kid. You know, the the, the spunky kid. Yeah. Like, they introduce these characters for no real reason and then, like, kill the babysitter and the kid gets away, I guess. I can't even remember. And, like, that has nothing to do with the rest of the movie. And that's fine. I mean, it was a fun, like, I enjoyed that segment. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think if it were, like, a webisode, of a, if they were, like, Halloween webisodes, here, the babysitter. Okay. You know, that would have been fun. But um, it just didn't feel like the movie had any real, like, cohesive vision. Mm -hmm. uh, so I was, I was very frustrated by that, but I don't know. I mean, maybe I'm being too picky. I'm like, basically, you know, I mean, Halloween, what is it? It's like Michael Myers goes around and kills people. If you're asking <laughs> more than that, you know, you're not, it's, you're looking at the wrong franchise probably, but mm. yeah, it just didn't do much for me. I don't know. I didn't get to see it, but all I wanted was for Laurie Strode to be Sarah Connor. Yeah. <laughs> like that's what I wanted out of the movie. And I, yeah, yeah, you get ten minutes of that. that. That's not the entire plot. Yeah, you get you get you get like ten minutes of that. I didn't rush cool. out to see it once I missed it with Michael. Yeah, I also I, I I had the very unfortunate experience of seeing it as a triple feature with Black Christmas, the original Halloween, mm -hmm. and then that. And I think compared when you watch it like up against those two movies, you, you know, you see Black Christmas, which I think is a great movie. You see the original Halloween, which is a great movie, and then you see that, and you're like. Yeah, you, you, there's clearly like not the same ability to direct and to build these scenes and to generate tension as there was in the original Halloween. I think that maybe made the experience worse for me because I just saw like the, the good version of it. And, you know, you see this and you're like, oh, in contrast, these do not, you, you know, you see where the weaknesses are. And, you know, they had the fun like fan service things where they have the like her standing outside the school where they recreate that scene and they like they recreate the scene where she's. Where, where he falls out the window and you see, you know, he's on the ground and he's gone and they do it. So they did some fun. There were some fun nods. It really felt like a fan film. I guess maybe that's my, that's what it all comes down to. It felt like some, yeah. some the movie made some stuff and like, I I would have been like pretty good fan film, you know? Pretty, well, I think good. that the, the whole middle of the movie was a rampage against the town and I understand why they did that. I wanted to see the three, <clears throat> the three generations of women fighting him. I wanted to see that battle more yeah. than just the last 10 minutes of the movie definitely yeah yeah, yeah. and i mean the, the girl in high school there's all this like crap about her with her boyfriend who's cheating on and it's like what does this have to do with the movie like why do i care about this this has nothing to do with establishing these characters mm -hmm. just like oh teenage it felt like it was a random like teenage movie inserted into the middle of a uh -huh. halloween I don't. I I, can't, I just can't decide if they were like well we need something for this demographic and we need something for this demographic it just it really didn't feel like a, a cohesive movie. Anyway, well let's let's sorry, move no, on no, to it, but yeah. let's move on to the other two disappointments, and then we'll go uh, we'll get to the, uh, the the stuff that you liked uh, and some other uh, some other movies. The you the two disappointments you gave me were two of the biggest horror movies, and, and somewhat <laughs> sorry and somewhat dis and somewhat uh, well, I mean they they were sort of divisive, I think, amongst horror fans. Is they are a quiet place in Hereditary, and I saw, I never, I didn't see anyone say about either movie, this is okay. I either, I either saw I loved this or I hated it. Yeah. So let's start with with uh, a quiet place. <laughs> How did that wind up on your disappointment list? I hate a quiet place because it expects me to be an idiot, and all the characters are idiots. <laughs> <laughs> like 
And then I saw John Krasinski go on one of the late night shows and be like, I don't like horror. It's a family drama. And I was like, well, like, why are you trying to make a horror movie and then not understand anything about horror or how to, like, put it together so anybody cares? So, like, when they went to the waterfall and had a full conversation there, I, like, threw up my hands. I was like, why don't you, like, live at the waterfall or blast ACDC all the time so that you can live normally? And, like, why are you having babies? It's a whole, like, everything the characters did was so stupid and there's no way they lived for 400 days or whatever it is <laughs> living like that and being complete idiots and making all these mistakes all it just drove me nuts and like so the whole time i'm watching it i'm like okay so do you just expect me to be stupid like i can't invest in characters that are making really bad decisions constantly yeah. <laughs> like uh-huh. unless it's like, interesting and in this it was just like no they're just dumb <laughs> it was also i think it to, to me it suffered because it was basically a subtextless film that's just like, okay, here's a cool narrative idea. It's a high-concept film with no real point. Um, also, there's so many holes in the concept. Well, that's the problem, is that the, the, if you're going to have a high-concept film, right. it has to be narratively tight. It's going to be super tight. Right. And, and like, normally I don't care that much about narrative, and I'm okay with that kind of stuff, but, like, if that's the point of the movie, it, it just doesn't work. And and um, I think Sophie and I both don't – it's kind of like, I, I guess – I mean, I I don't want to disparage Stephen King because I think he's done a lot of great work, but I think there's like a genre of horror that's like Stephen King horror, which uh-huh. is more about like families than it is about the monster. And it's like kind of like here's a here's a family. Look at all the family drama, and I guess there's a monster on the side, and like that helps get involved with the family drama. And I think this is a movie in that in that ilk. And we're not. We're, it's just not really our favorite type of thing. Uh huh. If I was like 11 or 12 or something, maybe like uh-huh. I would be really excited. It just like, I don't know, it lost me so quickly with how, like, the decisions they were making were just so off <laughs> for that universe. Like, it's like you need to build the mythology and make sure it makes all sense, and it did not. <laughs> Well, I, I feel bad to say that I did actually enjoy the, the film. <laughs> 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 okay. no, no. You and you and like a hundred million know, other people, it's like, so it's fine. It's I mean, fine. Maybe people can set these things aside. I think that was one of my things with Hereditary too. Is it just kind of lost me like very quickly on investing in the universe they were building. Was it? Did, you, did it have <laughs> the? Did that have the bad decision thing? Is well, that was something that drove Roger okay. Ebert nuts. By the way. Great. Better than a quiet place. Like I think they actually like horror movies. You know? uh, <laughs> Hereditary frustrated me because I think there was a lot of amazing ideas in it, but they just didn't come together. Um, like I, I, I think if you're gonna like, I love the the. I mean, the the film to me, this is my interpretation of the film, is essentially like there's this woman who's dealing with her own mental illness and the family stuff, and she has no power to resolve any of it. And she basically spends her whole life just stuck in this, in this hopeless situation, powerless to fix anything. And she creates these models to try and like make a world that she has some ability to manipulate and control. And I love these ideas, but then the movie just does like a bunch of other nonsense that doesn't really, really wish, focus I, on that. I really wish the dioramas were even more yeah, involved they just weren't and do in more cross cutting between the dioramas and the reality. I mm-hmm. think that would be really cool. Yeah. Um, I, I think Satanism movies have a really hard time when it's like it boils down to the last five minutes and they're like, and it's Satanism. You know, it's like uh-huh. so many do that where that's the punchline at the end. And it's like, well, that's not that interesting to me. <laughs> well, that's where it lost a lot of people, that third act. When people's, yeah. People, they thought it was very tense up until that point. And some people yeah. questioned whether it was horror up until uh, that point again. I think I might be a sociopath, but I did not find the movie. I, I found nothing like tense or scary or like interesting about the movie the whole way. Like I just thought it was boring. But um, yeah, I just wish. I, I think that there's a really interesting movie in there, and I'm wondering if I think it is like 75 percent to a great movie. It just like didn't stick the landing for us. 25. But <laughs> I was really annoyed, and I think there's some articles about it too. It's like with the whole Satanism thing with the girl, like the fact that the demon, I'm spoiling it now, but the demon is like inhabiting the girl, but the girl's not good enough and it needs a man. And it was like a really weird, like anti-feminist thing that really bugged me or like even an anti-trans thing, um, like de- buried in there. Like there's just something to work out there about like the male versus the female in there that like I was really bothered by it. I'm not sure I ever quite worked it out. I'm not sure the filmmakers ever worked it out. So I, I don't know, that just kind of bugged me too. I would bet money that the movie as shot, you know, from the script was like three and a half hours long 
and that they then painstakingly cut it to a, a two hour movie that was also too long, but couldn't afford to like be chopped more for mm-hmm. the cohesiveness of it. I, I just feel like there was not a, a like, it was, was a first yeah. draft. It's a first like, draft movie. I was more mythology too, with like the the grandmother and like Aunt Dow's character. Like, show me more of like what they're up to. I think the problem with Satanism though is that there is nothing more. You know, like in all these going back to the seventies, like in all these Satanism movies, they're just never interesting. Well, the, one know. of the things I really liked about it is is how different it, it was from what I expected from the marketing. Because mm. because they focus on the little girl so much in the marketing. I see, yeah. And people talk about, people compared it to Carrie. So you think it's going to be this, this little girl who, who's sort of fighting against this larger world. And again, a big spoiler alert. We can't really get into detail without spoiler. The moment that she's gone was very shocking to me. Yeah. Yeah, I guess that was a good moment. Those are good moments in the film. a lot of people there, too. Yeah. I like, guess as far as people liking it or I not. Just, I feel like her eating those brownies was a, like a weird decision for her. Like if you have like, yeah, it didn't a, make any sense. If you have an allergy yeah. like that, like why are you just eating random stuff? I, I really feel like it was it was just old enough to know better. It was like it was like a great first it was a great first draft script and and they just were like let's go into production. I think honestly all the A twenty four films or mo- many of the A twenty four films uh, in that are horror that are like the quote unquote elevated horror. They really are like not. They don't really understand their own subtext. I think, or they make mistakes uh-huh. about their own subtext. And like the film goes and goes and gets made, and they don't really understand kind of what they're saying with the film. Like, I don't. I don't want to go off on too many crazy tangents, but like the witch. If you look at the witch, the the actual thesis of that film is that like women are evil, and that that. Uh, like fundamentalism is correct that you should be like afraid of Satan and afraid of women. And Mm -hmm. like, that's, that's the conclusion of that movie. You know, you're like, like which evil, like Satan women who eat babies exist. And like being a crazy, like fundamentalist zealot is, is the correct way to prevent them from taking over. Like that is actually what the movie's saying. And I know that the writer and the filmmaker did not mean to say that with the movie, but Uh that's what he's saying. That's what the film says. If you look at, it comes at night. Is that the name of it? Yeah. It comes at night. Same thing. Like the thesis of that film is that you should be paranoid and selfish and like lock people out. Like you shouldn't help other people. Mm -hmm. That's the thesis of the film. I mean, like, again, I'm sure the filmmaker didn't intend to say that, but that's like what the conclusion of the film says. And I really feel like all these films are, are really problematically written without, they're, they're really interesting ideas. And the reason I'm being critical of them is because they're actually like great, great, starts to films and great mm-hmm. first drafts of films, which is further than most, you know, films get at all. Like, you know, if you're looking at a, a first draft, that's good is already like better than most mm-hmm. films turn out. So it's frustrating to me because I feel like if somebody sat down, you know, producer sat down with the, the filmmaker and said like, okay, let's really think about what the subtext is and think about how the storytelling is going to work and how to reinforce the ideas. What are we trying to say with this film? Um, there are ways to shift those films to work and to make them really good. But as they stand, they all kind of fall apart. Um, and I, I find that, you know, really is true in Hereditary as well. Like, I, I just don't really think there's a cohesive vision for what I'm not sure the filmmaker is trying to say. Yeah. Well, uh, Other than that men are better than women. No, <laughs> that's, 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 that's actually like a, I think that's a storytelling point that there's a convenience. It really drove me nuts. No, it, yeah. I really like stuck in my brain. It's like, what are they doing yeah. here? No, <laughs> the movie is Well, that's about from the, the, the point of view of the sort of the, <laughs> the, uh, the evil older generation as well. I yeah. guess, yeah. The point of the movie is that she can't control the mental illness is this this force that you have no control over. I and mean, that's the point of it. That's the oh, the point of the movie. I missed that. That's that's <laughs> what the movie's trying to say, but like it didn't really succeed at it. Well, you know, it's funny you mentioned the A24 films. Uh there's another A24 film that I think did understand its own subtext well that that you could consider a horror film if you really wanted to and that's Bo Burnham's 8th Grade. Oh yeah, we did not. We see didn't see that. it, but I've heard that. Yeah, I've heard it's very uncomfortable, and like I didn't really like middle school, so I really don't want to. See yeah, it. if you didn't like middle school, it's kind of a terrifying <laughs> film, so you could you could probably kind of yeah. kind of yeah. loop it in <laughs> there if you wanted to. 
forgetfulness, though, I cannot do. Like, one of Michael's favorite movies is Fast Times at Ridgemont High. And mm-hmm. so much of that movie is so real to, like, experiences I've had that I, like, I get sick, like, a feel, like, sick feeling watching it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so I can't deal. And I feel like eighth grade might be like that. Or yeah. maybe I'm giving it too much credit. I don't even know, but I just, like, don't even want to try. Ah, <laughs> uh, well, when you lock yourself in a dark room sometime and, and watch eighth grade <laughs> yeah. and see if it scares you more than, than A Quiet Place or Hereditary did. It, it probably would. It probably would. <laughs> And look, we're being critical of these movies, you know, like we're talking we about... We tear things apart. No, no, no. Look, like, we're being critical of these boy. movies, but but the fact is, like, they're the reason we're being critical is because they're, like, the start of something good, and they have good ideas, and they're good, you know, like, they're things that have potential and that are... There's value in them. I don't mean to say that there's, like, we're, I'm not saying, like, these movies are just suck and they're worthless. Like, there's actual value in them, and that's what frustrates me about them not being thought out fully. Right. And making well, movies is hard. I mean, it's oh, like, yeah. look, it's, it's hard. It's the hardest thing in the world, yeah. Well, the, uh, uh, to your point, you wouldn't have as much to say about something, say, like, uh, like Day of the Dead Bloodline. I couldn't even finish that. Yeah. Right. I, <laughs> yeah. I started watching I it. <laughs> yeah, because I started watching that because I'm just a, I'm a big George Romero fan and a big zombie fan. But it just, I, it, at some point... I, I thought I could be watching so many other movies right now. Yep, that's that's <laughs> that's a sad that's feeling. That's a definite experience. Yeah. <laughs> uh-huh. yeah. Well, well. I mean, I've, I've seen a lot of movies that have no value at all this yeah, year. So that's sure. you know, so it's not it's not. Um, so it's to say that these are you know these. I understand what people like in these. I just wish that they they took it a step further. Hereditary is maybe the most frustrating one because I'm like there's like a there's like a there's like a legendary movie in there. There's like a, you know, a, a, mm. a, a timeless classic movie in there if they wrote like five more drafts of it. Right. And cut it to like 90 minutes and like, you know, really focused on what the, what they were doing with it. Because there's great stuff in it. There's great direction. Um, there's great ideas in it. And so that's, that's my frustration. I like it. You know, when I'm critical of it, it's not, I'm not sitting here being like, hereditary sucks. You all suck for liking it. Like, <laughs> not liking I- it. <laughs> I didn't my gravity this year where it just makes me angry to think about <laughs> well you we know it's uh, about the the uh, the draft thing and about the the longer draft thing I kind of felt uh, uh similarly about Crimson Peak from a couple of years ago that it okay. was already maybe over two hours long but I feel like it needed another half hour yeah to I think there was some backstory that that but I know if he had made the movie the way that I would have been satisfied with it, I probably would have been one of ten people who saw it and enjoyed it. I'm not sure it, many people did see Crimson Peak. No, they saw it. They didn't it, like it. Was it. Big. I, it was big. Yeah. I liked it a lot. I think it didn't need any of those CGI ghosts or any of that at all and just let it be like a weird, gothic, like uncomfortable movie. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. It's a narrative disaster. Again, let's like, let's face it. Like it's just a complete. Yeah, it's it's so a complete. Though, it's a complete and mess. Great and like, but it's a great movie. Great. Yeah. Like, I don't know. There's so much good in it. <laughs> yeah. That's an example where like I don't really care about the narrative. Like the narrative does yeah. not work at all. Like it's just a total mess. Like it's not interesting. But I think the narrative is just there to string together like the imagery and the ideas and the. I mean, just the concept of like the blood, the the clay, the like red oh, clay man, with so the great. snow. Like there's just so many beautiful images in it and beautiful ideas and I I um uh is Jessica Chastain is the yeah. I I love Jessica Chastain so she's <laughs> you know mm-hmm. she just does a great job in that role and like it's just it's a, like a great movie to watch but it's not like objectively it's it's terribly written I mean like that's that's <laughs> that's the fact well, of it right it doesn't you work can be like if the ghosts are irrelevant then, yeah. then it's like well where, why is you know like why is that a problem but I love it yeah I liked it a lot. I did like it. I, I would like watch it again. I, I I feel like I need to revisit it. There are a lot of movies that I that I don't like on the first try that I feel like maybe I need to go back and and see if I'm missing something. But it's hard because there's so many movies I haven't seen yet. Do I give a new movie a try or do I give a, a, a old movie a second try? I almost never will rewatch a movie. <laughs> uh-huh. Which kind of drives Michael crazy because we have all these repertory screenings here, and I'll be like, "Oh, I saw that!" Like they're doing um, 
we just recently watched a bunch of De Palma movies, and they're doing, like, a De Palma series. I'm like, I just watched these movies, like, two weeks ago. I don't want to go. But uh-huh. they're on 30 millimeters, so, like, you know, <laughs> it's yeah. your chance to see it, so. Well, there is something to, uh, to to seeing things on the big screen. I try to do that as often as I can. I haven't seen uh, these, the uh, Suspiria uh, remake yet because I want to see it on the big screen where I don't have my computer in front of me yeah. Yeah. and I can yeah. put my phone in my pocket and just watch. I thought it was a really... I mean, I won't spoil anything about it, but I thought it was like a really, really immersive film. I was I, people have complained about it being too long because it is like it's like two hours and thirty it minutes. Uses the time. I was I was like wrapped the whole time. I just was really really into it, and I think that's a great example where the original Suspiria is not a narrative film. I mean, let's face it, right. Argento did not care about the narrative of the film. I mean, it barely has a story at all, and that's fine. I mean, it's just about the images and the you know the colors and everything and the music, and this film they took that like thin kind of narrative structure and added all this like political subtext to it and all these parallels with like 1970s Berlin. Well, I think that's the genius part is they took where the original was set, which is like 1972 Berlin takes place or seventies, whatever it takes that time period and then creates a whole mythology around what was going on in Berlin at that time, post-war Berlin. And it's super interesting to, like, go at a, re- a quote-unquote remake in that way of, like, the time period it was made. Because in Suspiria, it doesn't have any of that. Like, it's really not any sort of commentary on Germany or Berlin at all, or the world. Like, it's just mm-hmm. very similar to, to the school. And it has the same general plot, girl goes to dance school, done. You know, like, that's the plot <laughs> of the story. Like, done, you know? But the fact that they added so much to it, was really good. Yeah, amazing. you should it's write really the TV stuff. guide blurbs because that, yeah. that that would save them a lot of space if you wrote the TV guide blurbs. <laughs> um, it really is a it's film also, about subtext, it's and it's so beautiful. And like Tilda Swinton's amazing. Even the is it Dakota Johnson? Yeah, she does a really great job because she has some interesting acting to have to do. And then like I don't know, I just think it's really great. I had another thought, which I forgot. But that's okay. okay. <laughs> yeah, but it, it was one of her favorites. I mean, I think it's a, it's one of my favorite movies. Maybe like I, I, you know, I have to watch it more. But I think it's in my top movies ever. Oh, uh, it had the most inventive kill scene I've seen in years. That was the other thing. It's like a really drawn yeah. out ten minute kill yeah, dance scene. Don't talk scene. about it. It's but. so amazing and so beautiful, and I was blown away by it. And that's like coming from somebody that watches a horror movie every day. Like, you know, yeah. I was really impressed. And we talk about tension, but this is the maybe the only movie I've seen this year where I felt like not not tense in like in an exploitative way. Because sometimes there are movies that are like, oh, it's mean spirited or it's whatever, and that I don't really enjoy watching. But this like was tension in like a way that I was smiling the entire movie. Like I was just I really really enjoyed watching it, and I was like the way it was cut, the way it was shot, the performances, like the subtext of it. I just I really. I thought it was just a really, really impressive film. And it's it's really, again, like it's a divisive film. Like a lot of people hated it. Well, I think a lot um, of people were like, it's not red. You know, it's like not as colorful as the original. But I think, again, that goes back to the genius of them going to the time period and like letting it be desaturated because it's post-war and it's like a weird time period. Bleak. It's bleak, yeah. And so they let it be bleak. And it's like, it's this really, I think, very um, courageous remake in that sense, because they didn't just go for the fan service of, like, we'll just have, like, rock music and, and colorful lights. It's like they really tried to do something artistic with it. Yeah. They don't yeah. do, like, references to scenes in the no. original or anything. They just are, like, it's a compl- It's almost like a completely different movie based on the same two-paragraph plot summary, and that's really it, you know? That's interesting when people take that sort of direction. I know that that's... I'm failing to, to think of of uh, an example, but but I know there are there are people who've made movies inspired by a movie rather than a remake of a movie. Yeah, right. yeah. He's talking about doing a prequel that takes place with Tilda Swinton like 700 years previous, and I'm like, I would love if he does that because I think like there's a lot of mythology <clears throat> built up that's super fascinating. And that that was on your best of list that that uh, that you gave me. Let's look at some of the others on the best of. And we talked about hard to classify movies uh, and movies that some people might not 
uh, want to classify as horror, I think Sorry to Bother You would be in the middle of that kind of argument. Yeah, that was that's another one of those, like, one of my favorite movies ever thing <laughs> list. Uh-huh. Uh, and I, I saw that three times in the theater. <laughs> <laughs> just to give you, the just to give you how much I liked it. Um, so that's your top film of, of 2018? Well, I, you know, I, I, I think uh, Sorry to Bother You and Suspiria are both, like, I, they're very different from one another, but I think both those I would, I'm, I'm putting sort of as number one. You know, both they're both films that are going to be, like, hanging around for me for years and that I'll probably rewatch, you know, in the future mm. um, many times. But, yeah, Sorry to Bother You just, I mean, it's so hard to even talk about it. It's like such a... a uh, and I, I tried really hard. People kept telling me, they're like, you should go see this movie. Sorry to bother you. Don't watch the trailer. Don't read about it. Don't do anything. Just just show up. So I was like, I know nothing about what this movie is. And I just walked in and I'm like, okay. And I would say every 10 minutes, I was like, okay, that's this is not the movie I thought it was. Okay, this is, again, not the movie I thought it was. Right. Um, and that's a fun experience to have. And I think, you know, it was very inventive for the amount of money that it cost. Um, and it is it just is like a it's a it's a satire of everything and i think it <laughs> skewers i mean it skewers even the people who are the the heroes of the film like everybody is 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 you know has like i don't want to say blood on their hands but everybody is, is dirty in the film like you know you have no character who is like the the righteous voice really in the film at all um and i think that's a really fascinating choice to make like that to do that, to make the characters all likable, the you know the characters that you're supposed to like all likable, but to do it in a way without making them pure, I think is really impressive. Yeah, they you may they're likable to a point, but then they do things that that make you doubt them. Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I mean, the ending is crazy. <laughs> yes. <laughs> You can't spoil it, yeah. but it is so great. I love it. Uh, and, like, Michael went to a Q&A, and so, like, maybe you should say this, but basically, like, Boost Riley, they were asking him if they thought, like, the success of that movie was going to, like, generate other movies to be as weird and interesting as it, and he was like, no, because, like, again, they're going to miss what makes it good. They're going to be like, oh, it's quirky, like, sorry to bother you, but they're going to miss, like, all the social commentary, all the... It's not even just that. I think it's hard to quantify. Everybody's right. trying to what quantify is what, why is that movie a success. And, and they're it's gonna the be... whole picture, I think. Yeah. You know, and it's the vision of Boots Riley. Yeah, it's a brilliant movie. That's what makes yeah. it successful. It's not, you know... And he had a very hard time getting it yeah. made, as you might imagine. He but... actually worked on it, because I saw a Q&A with him where he talked quite a lot about uh, the making of it, and people asked him questions about the history. And he was in two Sundance labs, a writing lab and a directing lab. And he had been working on the movie for like 10 years or 12 years. Uh, and he said the only thing that kept him going was that he always thought he was three months out from shooting uh-huh. it. Like, he always felt like he was really close. And finally, what happened is this woman who is a producer, I, I, I'm blanking, I'm, I'm sorry, on the name of the production company, but it's uh, Forrest Whitaker's production company who did like Fruitvale Station and some other films. Um, one of their main producers, who's a woman whose name I can't think of offhand, she loved the script and believed in the project and went to her investors who had had funded Fruitvale Station and other movies and had made a lot of money. And she said to them, look, I've got this movie that I want you to give me money for, but I'm not going to let you read the script. You just have to trust me. (laughs) Because she knew that if anybody read the script, they'd be like, what the hell is this thing? And um, because she had made the money, they they said, okay. They said, yes, we'll, we'll give you money to make it. And that's the only reason that movie got made. Somebody went out on a limb for it. Yeah, yeah. That, that's another one where where I was delighted that it wasn't what was presented to me in the trailers. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. I started watching the trailer for that, and I got like 40 seconds in, and I was like, this trailer is really just like making me very bored. <laughs> so uh-huh. like, and already like Michael had already seen it once before I got to see it, and I was like, I'm just gonna go and not because the trailer made it look like The Office or something. I was yeah. like, not. It looked like it. a comedy, yeah. Exactly. And I mean, it, it is. It is. It is a comedy, and it is a horror film. But you know that—that's what sort of pulled me in as somebody, you know, who, whose day job is writing about comedy. I saw, you know, Pat Oswalt and David Cross yeah. are doing uh, the voices in this satire of, you know, yeah. uh, of black people working in this call center who have to use a white voice to sort of get over. And I enjoyed the the sort of satirical aspect of that. But it. it and and for the first maybe 20 minutes of the film, that's sort of the gag. Right. 
Right. But then, well, you know, what, what Michael said, it turns over so quickly and then turns over again and again and again. And even in that last moment, yeah, that, that, that last <laughs> sequence... You know, I know we've given out spoilers for other ones. This one I really don't want to give out uh, yeah. a spoiler for because it's so. <laughs> and I'm sorry that it's that it's sort of teasing, but it's so wonderfully bizarre. Yeah. And I think you no, know, this is when I when I talk about that fantastic idea, this like European idea of fantastic, like this is a perfect movie that fits in that. And so I think people who are into like that kind of film will love it. it. You know, it's not, a, it's hard to call it a horror film, but it fits in my, the genre that I like. That's the yeah. film in the genre that I like. Mm -hmm. You know, just like Suspiria is. And I feel like, you know, Suspiria and Sorry to Bother You are not the same kind of film, but they both mm -hmm. fit in the same genre for me. Like that's the, if, if, you know, if you can wrap your head around the thing that, whatever that fantastic idea is, that's, those are both films in that. I just think I like movies where they create a full mythology of how the universe works. And, like, Sorry, Sorry to Bother You is based in reality for sure because it's just, like, satirizing <laughs> it. But, like, it definitely creates its own universe. And the same with Suspiria. It's yeah. its own world. And, like, so it's, I think that's what I like. Well, yeah. That's the genre I like is, like, where you have to create a mythology. Well, that brings us to another one on your uh, best of 2018 list, and that, that's Mandy, which definitely <laughs> created its own world. Yeah. I think, like, Mandy, I ended up really loving Mandy, but the first half hour I was very bored and lost. And I think now if I went back and watched it, maybe I would understand that it was going somewhere I would enjoy. Uh -huh. <laughs> I think the first half hour was just so, like, okay, it's a, gonna, either going to kill the wife, it's a revenge film, whatever. Like, I was very bored with that idea. But then, like, the cinematography and the performances, and, like, once Nick Cage is let loose, it's really delightful. <laughs> right. <laughs> We saw in the theater. We saw the, the like a world like a premiere of it here, I guess. And uh, it was with you know we had a Q and A with Nick Cage and the with uh, Panos and um, and the guy who I, I'm blanking on his name. The guy who plays the preacher. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I feel like it was a really important to see it in a in a theatrical experience because. I, the way I describe it, people people are like, oh, should I see Mandy? And I'm like, you know, it's not really even a movie. It's pretty much just like two, two hours of like pulsing sound and like red lights flashing, and uh, and I mean that not in an insulting <laughs> insulting way, because I feel like there's not really a you know there's not a plot. It's just like these weird surrealist kind of like dream things, and it's an experience. Like it's a really I thought it was a great experience. I loved watching it. But what is? But it's definitely yeah. It's not it's not a narrative film. No. What what does what is the the. Uh... The description Nick Cage uses for his style of acting is Western Kabuki. Is that it? Yeah. Do you remember yeah, that? Yeah. <laughs> right, yeah. And that I this him being a genius actor because I've seen videos of him now speaking about and in, in the Q and A, and he really has such a full breadth of knowledge of the history of film and the history of performances that he'll be like, oh, here I'm doing Nosferatu and I'm doing this with my hands. And, you know, it's like he really understands how it's going to play on camera and then he just, like, chooses from this incredible toolbox. And I think he's actually, like, I've come around to him being, like, a really, really great actor. Yeah, he definitely has his own style, so it's not, like, the kind of acting that people are... Well, it's over the top for people, but, like, it's... I think we were going to come around to like, because one thing Michael and I complain about in modern, especially TV and in in movies is like when people are whispering really quietly. Cause like, it's not, it feels like too melodramatic and it's like, and especially when you watch old movies where people project and I talk to people in life and they're loud and it's like, and then you get to a movie and they're just like whispering at each other for no reason. Uh -huh. the whole time. It yeah. like makes no sense. And so Nick Cage is like the complete opposite of that style of acting that's become very popular. Right. Well, the, yep. name the the any other actor who could have done this film. Hey, you can name any of the best actors around. The people who consider the best actors. You're you know the Dustin Hoffman or, or or Robert De Niro or any of the the, the classic anybody brings up as the the best <laughs> actors. They couldn't they they couldn't come close to doing. Not that performance. No. But no. It would be they could maybe do something cool, but it would be different. And yeah. that's one thing we say about Vampire's Kiss is, like, if you go back and watch that Nick Cage film, it's like nobody would have chosen to do the performance that way. There's no way. And it's so good. Like, him just leaping on desks and pointing at people. And it's like nobody would have made those choices. You know? uh, well, even, Which, like, going back to, what, what is it? Uh, is it Betty Lou or Betty Sue got married? Which one? What's the name of it? 
Peggy. Peggy did. Yeah, that that it kind of felt like he was in a different movie than all the other actors. <laughs> he often like is. That, yeah, yeah, he often is. Yeah, um, but it worked. Actually, yeah, in Mandy, he was actually Panos approached him. Uh, Panos Cosmatos is yeah. his name. Yeah, sorry, I blanked on his last name for a second. He approached him About to the play Calvary. the preacher. To play, he he wanted him to play the uh, the the villain role, and. Um, Nick Cage read the script and was like, "No, I want to play the lead." And and uh, and Panos was like, "No, because the lead is supposed to be a young guy. It's supposed to be about age differences between the two and everything." And um, they kind of sat on it for a while. And eventually, he came around to like being like, "Okay, yeah, Nick Cage in the lead, and then we'll get you know somebody else." So they, you know, he changed the movie around kind of from his vision a little bit to uh, to to make it to accommodate to accommodate I mean, Nick Cage. But it was the I right choice. I literally make any choice. If Nick Cage is going to do my movie, like whatever you want to do, let's do it. Try to picture just that one frame that they they use in a lot of the uh, the reviews oh, yeah. and everything of him in the car covered in yeah, blood, just <laughs> grinning fiendishly. <laughs> what other actor could you picture in, yeah. in that still? And he says that that face is exactly from uh, some kung fu movie, right? Yeah, he, took, I, he <laughs> says he, referencing something. Yeah, specific. and then he, like I looked at the side by side, yeah. and he literally is making the same exact weird smile as, as some kung fu movie. I forget yeah. what it is, but yeah, he's like just chose it from the air. You know, he like he knows it works. You did, know, and like yeah. if somebody's gonna let him do it, like he was gonna did, do it. Did you see Mom and Dad yet? We we started watching it and then ended up not finishing it, but we're gonna we're gonna go we're back gonna and watch it. it. Yeah, and I haven't seen it yet either. I want to see it. In the first twenty minutes, they broke the hundred and eighty degree rule of camera filmmaking in not a good way. I got so confused about where anybody was supposed to be sitting that I had to turn it off. <laughs> but, that happens I mean, to me a lot watching, especially, you know, the uh, uh, bad horror movies, uh, you know, B movies, or even even sometimes on a TV show. When you know, two, in, and it's it's just two people talking in a room, and the camera's placed in, in such a at such an angle that you're wondering, well, are these two people even in the same room yeah. or the same yeah. city yeah. or the same? Yeah. Half we, the time they're not. We have we have a joke right. uh, <laughs> called called Tim Curry and the dog. Have you seen the movie Clue? Yes. You know you know how Tim Curry feeds the dog outside. I, like he feeds a steak to the dog. It doesn't matter. Right, right, right. We're convinced they're never they're, in the they, same place. We're not convinced. They're definitely never. They were, Tim Curry and, a do, and the dog were never in the same <laughs> universe. universe. Like they never were uh-huh. together. On so we always joke about how like when somebody like something no is shot. There's shot, yeah. yeah they, they were like clearly the two actors were not together. They just kind of, kind of were like cross-cutting to, to make it seem like they're in the same room. We uh-huh. call it a Tim Curry and the dog. Now, I want to get to the other two on your liked film. I didn't get to see either of these films, so I'm interested in, in what you have to say about it. We'll start with You Were Never Really Here, and that's another one that that uh, I'm not sure fans would necessarily agree is horror. What, what uh, do you say? <laughs> no, it's, I guess it's, um, I guess you could say it's more thriller. I think, I think Lynn Ramsey is a really incredible filmmaker. Um, like you, we need to talk about Kevin. I watched after watching You Were Never Really Here, and I was like totally blown away by that movie. But I think this is a movie where again the plot is so boring that like I could care less. And uh-huh. it's like basically like this like you know rundown guy who's like doing like you know jobs from really mercenary jobs. Like is gonna go rescue some girl from like a yeah like pedophile a, ring. Yeah. Okay, so like, he gets hired uh-huh. to do this. So like that is already like the most tired and boring and cliched plot that I could think of but the filmmaking is so incredible and like the way she uses insert shots to tell a story the color palette it has a really surrealist moment towards the end that like just blew me away and I loved so much it was very like David Lynch um just that end part but it's just really good filmmaking and it was really captivating Mm -hmm. yeah the editing the editing the sound design is amazing uh uh Johnny Greenwood is that the guy Radiohead the guy from Radiohead Who's not Tom York? No, the, uh, I think Johnny Greenwood um, did the music, did the score, and it's like the score and sound design just because the movie is kind of claustrophobic. It's not that she doesn't do a lot of wides at all. No, it's almost it's all like up. it's all like mediums and closes, and like the way the music works, it's just like really, really good filmmaking for like a script. Like if you handed that script to like another person, it would be a terrible movie. Mm-hmm. It's not one of those where like the script is not really interesting. But the film is really interesting, and it's really well yeah. done. It's really captivating, and the performances are captivating. The, the young girl, I, can't, I don't remember her name, the actor who plays the, the young girl, um, 
is amazing. Like she is great. Yeah. And Joaquin, Joaquin Phoenix, Phoenix is, is great. Good. Yeah. So I highly recommend it just for Lynn Ramsey. I feel like I'm gonna watch every Lynn Ramsey movie from now on. Like <laughs> that's it. It's great. And the, the last one on your list is kind of a surprising one, but I've heard it, it might benefit from low expectations. I didn't. I thought it looked silly. A lot of people said they thought it looked silly, and then they watched it and kind of liked it. And that's Upgrade. Oh, it is kind of silly, but it's like a fun sci-fi. It's kind of low budget. Um, there's a lot of humor in it. Feels like a '90s like direct-to-video like canon action film. That's, uh-huh. that's the way I describe it. But like a good one. But it's funny, you know, <laughs> like you know. better than like Cyborg because we were, we've been oh rewatching God. some of those '90s Cyborg action. Cyborg was one of my favorite movies when I was in junior high. I loved it, and we just rewatched it, and I was like, this movie Not that good. is so incompetent in every single <laughs> Not way. That good. And well, I was just amazed. Like, what captivated me as, like, a 12-year-old to that movie? I don't know. <laughs> well, what makes this, what lifts this above just being a schlocky tribute? It's got a good sense of humor. It's got performances that are fun. It's got, like, it's just got, like, it's a fun concept. It's a good high concept. I mean, do, do you know the, did you did you watch it? I can't, I can't remember if you watched it. I haven't it. watched it yet. I was okay. planning on watching yeah, it and got the, derailed. I mean, the concept, they reveal the it's not, I don't think it's too spoilery. The, the guy is paralyzed. He agrees to have, like, a brain implant uh, put in that can control his body for him so that he can, like, move again, you know, basically. But the uh, he decides, I guess, to get revenge because his, his wife is killed. And um, so he's getting revenge, and he basically just doesn't have, his you know, his way of fighting is that he gives autonomy to the computer that's part of his brain yeah control his body mm-hmm. so he doesn't actually like control the fighting the computer is the one right and the computer will be like do you consent to me like taking over your limbs and he's like in a jam he's like yes 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 and then like the computer like beats up the other people basically. and then kind of controls him yeah as much as possible from there uh-huh. yeah and then of course there's like the story you know where does that go from and it's there? like just hilarious sequences of him it, like his facial expressions when like you know the chip is like controlling his limbs where he's just like confused you know it's like it's just fun uh-huh. <laughs> yeah so it's kind of hilarity it's it's brutal the violence in it is pretty brutal yeah uh which i think is fun for an action movie in that in that kind of vein um it's got good like tech i mean it's definitely you know i i'm sure the movie was made for for like five five dollars yeah, but, but um, it looks it's fun. good yeah it's fun yeah. I think like Black Klansman was the other one that we really liked. Yeah, there's some other bunch of yeah, others, but yeah. Others, yeah. But yeah, no, Upgrade's a fun movie. I think like it's yeah, you and know. it's under the radar. Like um, when we still had Movie Pass, we were like, oh, we'll just go see this movie, <laughs> which was a yeah. nice thing. So we definitely right. just, like chance on it. It's a Blumhouse movie, so it, you know they're they're going for kind of a mainstream yeah, thing, but style, yeah. uh, but Lee Winnell made it, who made uh, you know made the Saw movies and and other stuff. Like he's sort of known for that. Mm. But yeah. Fun movie, fun movie. And there are four movies you listed. You said you liked were smaller releases. Uh, there is one that's on Hulu now that I didn't get a chance to watch because I was about to watch it and then got sick with sort of stomach problems and decided maybe this isn't the movie to watch right now, and that's The Cleanse. Oh, yeah. I dug that. Uh, yeah, that had been sitting around on... Um... It, it was at festivals a few years ago. It took a while to get, to get a release, but it finally did. And it's a, a, another kind of like small contained movie. It has big actors in it. And um, it's a very, I thought it was a fun, clever satire about like trying to, uh, you know, this is a great New Year's kind of uh, idea about like, I mean, the, the premise is this guy, uh, I'm trying to decide what to spoil, what not to spoil, but the, the, the premise is basically this guy's life is a mess. And he decides to go on this like cleanse retreat, uh-huh. and like the idea is that the cleanse like manifests itself as like a physical entity, and so you, you know having to deal with that. But it's not quite. It's not like it's not like a malevolent. You know, because it sounds like oh, it's going to be this like malevolent monster that he fights or something. It's not really about that. It's about like it's about how you. Uh, are your own worst enemy in life, I guess, is the way. It had a lot of good subtextual stuff. It had a lot of interesting... It was a you know, very contained, simple movie that I thought was really fun. And uh, Johnny Galecki, who is, you know, I know originally from Roseanne, maybe, but but, but is now known for uh, Big Bang Theory, mm-hmm. is the lead in it. Angelica Houston's in it. Um, some other people, too. So it's a fun movie. I, I thought it was a, you know, really interesting idea. Again, really simple movie. Um but I thought it was cool. I really liked the ending. I really like where it went at the end. Um, so, yeah, good one, I thought. Mm-hmm. 
and you were the only one who saw it. Yeah, yeah so if you didn't see it. it. Yeah, because yeah. I, I think that the, that uh, well, let's move through quickly through a couple of the others because I think the other I think three out of four of these are ones that only you saw, and that's to Helen back and look away. Yeah. My, yeah oh yeah, you didn't see either. either. Yeah, so Helen back is great. Is uh, I saw it twice in the theater, uh, <laughs> but uh, it's a Kane Hodder documentary. And um, it's a really, you know, it's an interesting story. I mean, he's an interesting guy. Uh, for anybody who doesn't know, he played, he's most famous for playing Jason in the later Friday the 13th films. And as a young guy, he was, you know, doing stunts in films. And he did a demo for the news media in his, like, hometown uh, of a fire burn. And he, he set himself on fire and didn't really do it properly and ended up getting really bad burns and was in the hospital for months and, all, you know, almost died from that and it's just kind of like about his story and about uh, you know how he dealt with that and came back and he's a really he's a he's a uh, he's a likable guy and I think it's a really it's a moving it's a very moving movie mm-hmm. um, and I think it's uh, if you're into horror it's a very fun it's a, it's a worth watch a worthwhile watch mm-hmm. oh look away it was another really small movie Jason Isaac Jason Isaacs can do no wrong yes <laughs> uh, Mira Sorvino and uh, India Isley, who's the lead, and um, the daughter of Olivia Hussey, who is in Black Christmas, is, in Black Christmas, oh, yeah. is most famous for Romeo and Juliet, for being <laughs> Juliet in the 60s, right. Romeo and Juliet, uh, but is in Black Christmas and Psycho 4, who I, you know, I'm a fan of, I'm a, an Olivia Hussey fan, so I was like, okay, cool, her daughter's in a movie that's a horror movie, I'll check it out, and we uh, we got a screener of it, and we did an interview with them uh, for um, for their press day. And I think it's a movie that, uh, it, you know, it, it hasn't really hit. I think nobody's seen it. It just came out on VOD. It didn't, it didn't VOD. no theatrical or anything. It's and on Amazon nobody, now. Yeah, it's, it's, it's out there. And I think um, a lot of people look at it as like a really straightforward teen kind of, you know, horror movie about it's this young girl who has kind of a rough life and there's a mirror image version of her that she kind of lets loose that's all of her desires and it does all the bad things that it wants to do. And I feel like there's a lot of really interesting stuff in it about uh, the, cause it, it, a lot of doppelganger movies, there's like, Oh, it's the good version. And then you let loose the evil version and the whatever, right. but this isn't really oh. evil. It's like her real internal wants and desires. And um, it does, I think it falls apart a little at the end with, in terms of being, you know, more like pure evil, but mm. a lot of it is really interesting. Cause it's like, it's not, it doesn't quite, it's it's like subtly different from what you would expect in, in that realm. And I think uh, India Isley does a really good job playing both the roles. And um, the way I, I sort of talked about it was like these two roles, it's not just that they're opposites, it's that they start out as opposites and then kind of like gradually merge as the film goes on in a, in a way that I really enjoyed. I thought it was really, mm. uh, the reviews for it are all pretty negative. So, uh-huh. you know. A lot, I think a lot of people didn't really, you know, they see it as kind of like a straightforward middle of the road thriller horror movie. And um, I think it's beautifully shot. The performances in it are really good. I think the characters are all complex and all interesting. And um, I don't know. I think it, it deserves a little more than it's, than it's been mm. given. And the fourth film on your list, I think you both of you saw, was Butterfly Kisses. And this one I don't really know anything about. So I'll have to trust your judgment what is butterfly kisses yeah it's a it's a sound footage film we caught it at genre blast film festival last year and we were like not really wanting to sit down and watch a sound footage film because it's not really a genre that we're ever that interested in but we took a chance because the filmmaker was there <laughs> I'm like all right we'll just watch this guy's movie but it really surprised me because it, it was really interestingly done where it's like three layers of who's making the film because it's it has like these teenage kids who are investigating like a creepy pasta monster in their town, and they're they have made like footage from that, and then they're it's been found this footage by mm-hmm. a filmmaker who then is trying to like finish their film and like create the the mythology in the world about this film that he found the footage for, and then there's like a third layer of a documentary crew that's following this guy who's found this footage and it was really interestingly layered as like who the film is about what the mystery is and then especially 
the most interesting part maybe to me was the documentary crew and then like their journalistic integrity towards the end of like how much do they get involved with this guy who's kind of losing it mm-hmm. so, and do they believe him you know do they believe yeah. him is he is he bullshitting he, the whole thing he is he just like, film this footage because he's yeah. a filmmaker and so it's like it was really well done i thought with the three layers it was like a deconstruction of found footage films and about and of documentary filmmaking and like it was just a really i i don't think i've ever seen a found footage movie that i really liked Mm-hmm. It's because it has so much to say about like. And this one I did, yeah. yeah that's what I'm saying. Like this one I and really like. It's on Amazon. I know it's it's available now. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it just came out. Yeah. There were. So, even the the monster is is kind cool. of funny because yeah. it's, it's like I mean it's based on other things, but it's basically like a if you look in, at this guy at the end of the bridge, every time you close your eyes, he's closer to you, and then when he gets super close to your face, he tickles your eyelashes. <laughs> <laughs> The butterfly kisses thing. Yeah, you can feel his eyelashes. That's but it's how close actually, like, yeah. genuinely pretty creepy yeah. throughout yeah. the film where they're looking at footage and, like, they see him in the footage and he's, like, a little bit closer, you know? So it's, it's well, actually genuinely well done. I enjoy yeah. the creepypastas. There's a lot of them, even Slender Man, which has become kind yeah. of this, this is blown out of proportion and people have done some really sort of kind of hacky things. It's become its own sort of... It's kind of... Slender Man's kind of become... I don't know, a bit overused now, but I, but I, that original intention for the creepypasta was great, and there are some really weird ones out there. I don't know if you've seen the uh, the Squidward suicide uh, tape. I don't think so. No. <laughs> That's one of the the creepypastas that 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 uh, a filmmaker, one of the cartoonists, I guess. Um, I'm, I hope I'm getting this the story right. Sort of went a little insane and 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 did this this short of Squidward committing suicide, which is genuinely disturbing. If you, if you look it up, I mean, just beyond the fact that it's a, that it's a, a, you know, famous children's character committing suicide, but just the, uh, there are actually cartoons up that people made to, to, to look like this creepy pasta. It's kind of insane. (laughs) We, We have a few more movies to get to. I want to try to go through quickly because I, I want to uh, I want to talk about clickbait as well. Uh, two more quick lists. We'll start with mixed but notable. This this was your designation for revenge and annihilation. Yeah. What uh, what made them mixed for you? Uh, I really wanted to love annihilation. I'll start with that one, just because it's like it felt like predator to me, but with women. So it's like five women are going into the jungle and like you know, there's a monster or whatever. And like, if it were just that, it would have been my favorite movie this year, probably. Uh But it's just, some of the writing was so hacky with like, you know, there's like a scene where they all have to say like, why, like, it can't just be like, these are women scientists who are curious about the world and like want to, you know, discover something. It has to be like, Oh, I have cancer. Oh, I'm an alcoholic. Oh, I'm like, you know, going to die in some other way. But it's not even just that. It's that they're they're like sitting on a boat, the two characters. (laughs) And then they all have to reveal it. No, no, no. They don't even reveal it. They, the two characters talk about the other characters. She's like, so what's the deal with all these characters? And then the other one's like, well, this one has, you know, it's, it's like, this is literally the worst writing possible. And then the other worst thing about it is like, she's, like having this affair with a colleague and so it's like it keeps flashing back to this affair that just like annoyed me and like all the flashbacks into her old life were just so horrible and had again nothing to do with anything yeah. and then the whole wraparound of her telling the story later is like also just really aggravating so it's like if they would just gone and made a movie about women scientists going to the jungle it would have been great and I loved the monster and like like a lot of the um, production design of the creatures and stuff was really cool it just like did some stuff that was really like annoying. I thought it was. I I, I would go. I liked it more than Michael. I would go so far <laughs> as to say I thought it was a very bad movie. No. But but what's interesting about it is that it, I thought it was a very bad movie that you could. I, it was like two hours or maybe over. I don't know. It was long, but that you could take and cut an 80 minute movie out of it. That would be a great movie. Oh yeah. Like without even doing Definitely. anything else. You just like, need to it's, edit it's out there. all the bad stuff. You just have to get rid of all the crap. <laughs> I well, I, I wonder can... if the book was better. I haven't read the book. I've, I've heard the book is, is yeah. better. I think that the, the, um, I'm not a fan of the writer. I think he, uh, the director also, uh, no, 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 no. Alex, uh, the novelist, no, what? The novelist or the screenwriter? No, 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 no. The guy who directed, uh, Alex Gardner. Yeah. Okay. He wrote Ex Machina and Sunshine and a bunch of other movies that I'm like, 
they're all like kind of movies that I are on the right. It's again, same thing. This is back to the hereditary problem where it's like, they're on the right track. So I'm frustrated because like, they're, they're not, it's not like they're just crap. It's like, they're on the right track, but they just don't work um, for me anyway. And I feel like I'm frustrated because I want them to work. And I feel like he's got good ideas. I just wish they fixed like all the stuff that makes them fall apart. Well, I I was really looking forward to Annihilation. And the the thing that that got me is it seems like once they got into this world, they sort of set up the characters a little bit and they seem to abandon what they set up for the characters as soon as they got into this world. And I realize that's part of what this world does to the people who enter it. But it, it just seemed like... Especially uh, the the uh, um, I'm forgetting the character's name, the the sort of lead that that brings them into this world in the first place, the uh, the sort oh. of she she was set up as this tough tough character, and the second she gets into this world and sees any sort of gore, she becomes completely squeamish, right. and and just and just doesn't care anymore. Yeah, yeah. it's just like. I think part of it that bugs me is like if these were male characters, you wouldn't need like all this justification for why they would want to go into the jungle. It'd just be like, oh, some tough dude. It'd be Arnold Schwarzenegger <laughs> going to go into the jungle. You know, it's well, like like Predator. You need, yeah, exactly. You wouldn't need that backstory. You know, like of like why they're interested. It's just like they're interested because they're human. You know, right? And it's, I feel like with women, they have to be like damaged in some way, and like it's just like it really bugged me. It's just like just let them be cool people that are smart. You know. Uh-huh. <laughs> It was just very messy writing, uh, and that was a bummer because it's a cool. Again, I wouldn't care if it were a bad movie. If it were just straight bad, like who cares? But yeah. it was. It just felt like a bummer because they they had like. You know, there's an eight. Like I said, there's an 80 minute movie in there that is a great movie. Right. It's visually uh, stunning, and I think the beats are there. Right. Yeah. I exactly. Agree. Exactly. Yeah. So it's 115. I just looked it up. It's 115 minutes. I think if you made it 80 minutes, you'd have a great movie. Hmm. Yeah. Well, let's move on to Revenge. Uh, I did see Revenge as well, and and I didn't really like it. Yeah, it's frustrating film, I think, for me, because I do like a lot about it. I love the end scene. Um, I think it's, the worst part of it is that it has a rape at all, <laughs> like, mm-hmm. which is funny because that sets up the character, supposedly, but I think it's just most dangerous game. It doesn't need the gratuitous rape scene to me at all. Um but that's so the it, that's the plot that that this woman is brought to this remote place, and and, and taken advantage of, well, raped by the, this one character who's who seems like a, a like this a, a good sort of rich guy at the beginning, and she's left for dead and hunts them all but down. Like, but that's not even the guy who who like who commits the rape and like it's conf- it's a confusing movie we, it's like, yeah, we saw it dancing around it just seemed like she like they were setting it up like she was partly to blame for it and i was like we saw q a with the director who really like i i already thought the the whole first act was bad but we saw q a with the director where she basically said that the rape was just like a not really important to the movie which i thought uh, was a, very problematic i think if there's a rape in your movie you have to justify um, it and it wasn't justified in this film, I thought. It's also like... It wasn't necessary. It's just like they want to hunt a person. They're there to hunt. You know, they have their guns. They're ready to... Yeah. The rapist is the second most evil character in the film, too, because he gets killed. You know, if you look at the order of deaths, so this is like... You can clearly see the intent of the filmmaking. He's not the last guy who gets killed. He's not really the villain. He's not the main villain. Mm-hmm. Right? It's the... It's the, it's the boyfriend. The boyfriend guy. So, like, if the boyfriend guy is the main villain... Who kills her? I mean, it basically throws her off the, you know, the. I'm spoiling it, I guess, whatever. Right. Um, well, I think if just, you're watching the movie, you've probably that that's yeah. probably in the description. Yeah. <laughs> I'm I'm just confused about why the rape is in the movie. Yeah. It just doesn't really actually. It's not even part of the setup. That's the confusing part. It's like not even really in the setup. The really the setup is that he kills her, and then she comes back and then like hunts them all down. So like it, the movie really, I thought the first act was really a mess uh-huh. and didn't work but i love the second the, the last two thirds i thought it was really fun like i really enjoyed a lot of it i like the yeah. filmmaking it's very like, it's, bright and almost cartoony in the yeah it's not realistic it's, yeah it's i think goofy. that's what i like yeah. yeah it's almost like a quentin tarantino-esque yeah i mean she said she loves rambo and stuff and i think like yeah it's a great like it's like rambo you know like rambo 3 when he gets hit with the shrapnel and shoves it through his body with the yeah, torch and stuff uh-huh. i mean, <laughs> you know, it's not realism. It's like just ridiculous action. There's blood. 
spew it. People were like, oh, they couldn't have lost that much blood. I'm like, are you really <laughs> like, are you really watching this movie and complaining that they yeah. lost too much blood? Like, <laughs> it's, a, it's a ridiculous movie. Yeah. Um, but I really felt like the first third failed to set it up correctly. And I and like Sophia said, if it were a, if it were just the most dangerous game movie where like she's there to be hunted, to be hunted, like great movie. Honestly, I think it's a great movie. Is um, is rape ever justified to portray in a film? I mean, could... I haven't found a movie yet where I felt like it because usually it's like either to like make the male character go into action or like set up some weird thing to show that the characters are bad. Like it's just mm. like it's if it's the point of the movie, right? Like, I guess if it's like a real like now you're gonna examine yeah. that for the rest of the movie. It's important in the accused or something like right. that, you know? Yeah. Like, yeah. Like you watch a movie that where it's like that's the in point most of the movie. Films, I don't think it's ever justified. <laughs> hmm. Just it's a la- it's lazy. It's lazy writing. Yeah, it's like this character's bad or this woman's hurt now. Like it's like I, you know do it in some other way that's more interesting. Hmm. Yeah. Now so we have a story. Yeah. Well, okay, we have three more films to get to, and these are uh, in uh, independent films you like that are coming soon. I'll I'll just give you all three that you put on the list. Oh. And we, if we can go through them quickly so we can uh, get to sure. clickbait. The Guilty Horror Movie, A Low Budget Nightmare, Deep Murder, and Live Scream. Cool. I also want to add Cam, because we just watched Cam, which is on Netflix, and mm-hmm. I actually thought it was really good. Yeah, Cam is one of our favorites of the year. It does add it since we talked to you, but yeah. um, uh, did you see that? Probably not yet. I've, I We started watching it and then did not finish it. Okay. Uh, anyway, we really like that, yeah. but we'll, we'll go to the other. I thought it was interesting how it, how it dealt with um, online personalities versus your own personality and what you need to hide and what you want to promote. It, it, it had a lot it of the themes of, of clickbait. It did. It actually, actually was kind of similar mm-hmm. to clickbait. And thematically, not... Yeah. not... Um, okay, okay, so... Uh, the the Guilty. Guilty is a Danish film that we caught at Beyond Fest. And it was super interesting to me because I read the description and I thought it took place in one room and I was like, all right, I have to go see this movie and see if they made it interesting. <laughs> and they really did. So it's like a cop who's like got in trouble. So now he's manning the phones for like a 911 call center. And so he gets a call about like kids being kidnapped. And the whole thing is just him listening on the phone to these people and like they keep hanging up and then he's calling other people to try to investigate it. Like he's sending people on these missions <laughs> all from the call center so it's really all his perspective it's all in his mind what's happening um not that it's fantasy i mean it's happening but you don't, happening, you don't you don't you, like you you're only getting what he's getting the info he's getting and then you're getting his reactions and like how he's trying yeah. to like deal with this kidnapping mm-hmm. it takes place in two rooms in this in this like nine one one what do we call it emergency dispatch a dispatch, it's a dispatch. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so, just really interestingly done and they even managed to do some interesting visual things where like the power goes out or he turns the lights off and it's only like the red light from um you know the phone or something like is lighting the whole room it's like it felt visually like they were doing something with that yeah they managed um, a lot with a with, small yeah they really space, thought yeah. about it and um and the, it was interesting how it all played out just over the phones and it really like i guess this actor is like a tv actor in like the Netherlands in Denmark. or Denmark, yeah. So um, he was really strong, I thought. So it was a really interesting movie that we just happened. It's to out watch. now, by the way, too. It, it is yeah, out. Okay, cool. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So the guilty uh, horror movie uh, only I saw. It's a documentary about the making of Red Christmas. It's not out yet. Um, Red Christmas is like an indie. I haven't actually seen it, but it's an indie movie with uh, D. Wallace in it, and it's. Uh, it basically is just like a perfect documentary about the pains of low budget filmmaking. Uh-huh. <laughs> Horror movie. It's called horror yeah, movie. it's called it's actually called horror movie, which is a hard title because yeah, I'm like, look up horror movie, and I'm like, yeah, oh yeah, no, that's like, yeah. <laughs> it's confusing. But um, uh, I don't know when that's coming out, but it's a really, it was like a, it was like a, tr- uh, uh, I, uh, Joe, I mean, I say this, you know, I don't mean to make light of PTSD, but I felt like watching it was a little bit of like a, a PTSD traumatic uh, experience for me because you you get all the like anxiety of remembering what it was like to suffer through production difficulties or like, uh, you know, other other challenges while you're making a movie you're like oh god i hope this and the you know i knew that the movie came out so uh i knew that like it would work out okay because i think if i were watching that and i didn't know that the movie actually got finished and you know it was um, at least a moderate success and the filmmaker was there and everything so i was like okay he's still alive the movie came out so it's, you know nobody nobody got hurt too badly um, but it's a very, it's a, like a really stressful, interesting look at what low budget filmmaking is like. And I thought it's, uh, it's really well done, really mm-hmm. well done. And I really feel for the guy, uh, the filmmaker who, you know, who's trying to make Red Christmas. And it was <laughs> quite fascinating anyway. Yeah. 
Uh, what was what was uh, the next on the list? Live stream. Oh, live stream. Another one we caught at festivals. Um, and deep murder was the other one. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And so live stream is basically like a Twitch feed of one guy playing this video game that ends up killing like the other people in the chat rooms and stuff. Um, so it, again, it's a movie where we're like, I have no interest in gaming <laughs> or uh-huh. watching. You play a game online, but it was super captivating, and so it had all these different levels of the game, so different styles of gaming were happening, like first-person shooters or like puzzle games. Um, it's really interesting, and so it's a female film like Michelle. In you know, Yeah, <laughs> good job. Um, and so I know she's working on distribution now, so hopefully it'll be out next year. But um, for a very low-budget film, that's again just one thing on the screen, so you get to see the chat screen, you get to see the game, and you see. Um, the guy playing the game in his webcam. Mm-hmm. Um, so your eyes are really darting between those three things the whole time, and it was very well done. Yeah, it's really interesting. I mean, I, again, it's a, like Sophia said, it's like this is this thing that I'm like, I don't want to watch this. But this person's nice, so we'll watch it. And then I'm like, this is a really <laughs> movie, you know? Yeah. So I'm always surprised. I mean, that's the nice thing about festivals is, like, you watch stuff that you would not – I would like, if I read that, I would never sit down and watch it. But at a festival, I'm like, all right, I'm here. I'll watch it. <laughs> and then I ended up being, being – like loving it, you know, I end up being like, wow, that was awesome. Like, I'm really excited that I sat down and watched it. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, Deep Murder, uh, we saw at the LA Film Festival. It's a, it's an interesting film. It's like a, a murder mystery sort of movie where a bunch of people are trapped in a mansion. But the the conceit of it is that they're caught in like a, a like 80s, 80s porn, porn movie. Cliche. So they're all like cliched <laughs> characters from like eighties porn, um, and like the you know they're and they they, they start tame. to realize they surprisingly tame. Yeah, it's not <laughs> like it's not really like it's not graphic at no, all. But yeah. <laughs> um, but it's a kind of like it's a it's an interesting movie. Uh, partly about I think it doesn't quite nail the theme stuff in it, but it's an interesting movie about like what it's it's celebrating the old days of like Cinemax is what I would say. <laughs> So it's like it's like softcore, like uh, you know, late night stuff, and the characters are kind of like from that, and they're looking at like how the that content was kind of like innocent compared to like what pornography has become, um, and it's just it's a fun movie. I don't know. That's that's really the whole thing. Do you know? I don't know when it's coming out. Yeah, that's what I was gonna. That's yeah, what I'm not I was sure. gonna ask. <laughs> Throw yet or anything, yeah. It's, um, but it's called uh, yeah, Deep Murder. There was an, inter- there was an interesting uh, uh, movie on Cinemax actually called Motel. I can't remember the country of origin of it, uh, but it was about a, a woman who haunts this motel, and there was definitely sort of a, a Cinemax, or I almost said Skinemax, which is what people used to call it, <laughs> feel to it that's actually good. It came out a, a couple of years ago. It's uh, it's it's got a lot of humor in it. It's there's some explicit content to it, but it's it's also got an interesting premise. Like this this the she this woman is haunting the motel where she was killed, so she gets to see all the nefarious things that go on in that room, and then finally somebody sees her and they fall in love, and it's 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 actually. It's a actually it's an episode of a series of it. It's called uh, Zoraid. It's part of the Motel series. That I thought was is worth looking up. Cool. Yeah, we'll have to check that out. There there are a couple of movies I wanted to give sort of an uh, uh, an honorable mention to that weren't on your list. I don't know if you've seen Apostle on Netflix. No. It's, we actually don't. We don't currently have Netflix. Ah, this is. We're the only people in America without, without Netflix. <laughs> It's uh, by Gareth Evans. It's set in 1905. It's a, there's a, uh, uh, a man returns home to find out that his sister's been held ransom in a religious cult. He has to go to this island to sort of rescue her. It's, uh, it's a, a very good film, sort of atmospheric, a good period piece. Uh, another one is a, a zombie film called Cargo, starring Martin Freeman. I don't, I don't know if you've seen that one. I hear about this. No, I haven't heard that one. It's uh, a man who's tr- who's who's trying to to save his daughter, uh, his infant daughter, and and sort of get through rural Australia uh, to 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 save her, to find some sort of civilization. 
and it's that that one is kind of more of a family drama that happens to have zombies in it. The ending, some people found silly. I liked it because the visual is strange. I don't know if I want to give away the visual, but because it gives away the the ending. But I I didn't mind it. Uh, some people found it silly. And the other one I want to quickly mention is All the Creatures Were Stirring by David and Rebecca McKendry. Yeah, we we saw that. We we uh, we saw the premiere of that here, and and uh, it, we enjoyed that. It was fun. It was a fun movie. Um, I love the ra- the wraparound was my favorite part. I found it so hilarious. Yeah, yeah. The, though I thought that was very clever. It's it's not easy to present an anthology in a new way. Yeah, right. and, and that was a cool choice. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, they set it up as a community theater thing. The two people are watching, and as they they begin each one, yeah, the wraparound. The, the beginning and ending is you see the community players start the story. I thought it was really inventive. It's very it, it it looks very cheesy. There's there's one we'll, we'll give away a little bit where a woman gets gored by a deer, and and when they come back, the community players are trying to show this, but this woman is throwing uh, like like red streamers out of her stomach <laughs> as a guy is holding a really cheesy looking like plastic. Fake or no, not even plastic. It's something they made themselves, sort of deer, yeah. and pushing it into her stomach. Yeah. Um, it's it's wonderful. And Rebecca McKendry did a really great movie called short movie called The Dump that I featured on the uh, Daily Horror Film Fest this year. So if you're if you're still in the holiday mood, I would yeah. definitely uh, uh, suggest All the Creatures Were Stirring. Which what is. I what I thought was cool about it too, if I can, if I can add one one little bit, is oh, that do. it's like, it's like, uh, it's sort of a horror movie, but it's also like more weirdo surreal like comedy, thing. like it's more like a surrealist weirdo movie um, than horror in a way, which I really like. I mean, that's mm-hmm. a, I'm a big fan of that. I love the aliens. I don't want to you know spoil them all, but the there's like the uh, the segment with aliens, which I think is just like has really stuck with me. I thought it was really, really fun. It was, concept, yeah. It has to do with yeah. uh, a man trying to celebrate Christmas, and he's trying to keep everybody away from his house yeah. on Christmas because of the strange thing that happens. And the way they set it up, you think he's going to be a werewolf. Yeah, I thought that was a really cool setup, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but that's not what happens. I, I won't reveal what happens. but Yeah. So it's a fun movie. It's, it, it really is like, I mean, you know, obviously there's a little like variability in the stories, but um, but I thought it, overall they were very strong compared to a lot of anthologies I've seen. You know, mm-hmm. a lot of the anthologies I'm like, oh, there's like one that's good. But this one I really, I thought there was something enjoyable about all the all the parts of it. And um, I'd like, and like Sophia said, the wraparound is, is pretty incredible. So. I need to look at more of their work because everything I've seen that they that they're involved with has has been wonderful. We just saw what was the one uh, barista? Oh, like barista yeah, we just saw a film that they made called Barista. A few, it, was really it was it was good also. Yeah, yeah so check oh, that out. I haven't seen that. I'll look at that one. Yeah. Right, so now we'll get to another movie that that people might find hard to classify and that's Clickbait, the yeah. movie you released this year. So how would you would you describe Clickbait as a horror film? We thought so. Mm-hmm. Um, I think certain venues did not think so. Uh-huh. <laughs> like when Trying to get sales agents, they were just like, some of them wouldn't even watch it. They're like, we don't do comedy. And it's like, well, I think it has like genuinely creepy, like Giallo stocking moments. It has like Halloween esque moments. Um, I think it's a horror movie, but it has a lot of humor in it. So it gets stuck into a comedy thing, but it's not really, I think, a straight comedy either. So it's ended up being very. It's fantastic. <laughs> yes. In a way that surprised us that people weren't more open-minded about combining yeah. those two elements. <laughs> when I saw, yeah, honestly, when I saw, sorry to bother you, I'm like, this is the movie I wanted to make with with Click. I mean, it's not, not the same. We didn't get we, No, there. no, they're just, <laughs> sorry to bother you. It was a much better movie, but like, but, but I was like, this is that's like what I wanted to achieve with it. You know, like that it had a lot. Of, it achieved a lot of the stuff that I was like, oh, I wish we could have achieved some of this. But um, yeah, it's a social. Sat- I mean, we've been describing it as like a social satire horror film. It definitely. It's it's I mean to me the horror part of it is that like the realities of the situations we're trying to examine are frightening, and it's not necessarily like the moments in the film are frightening. But I think we're I mean our attempt was to examine real issues about identity and about what impositions there are on young people in terms of 
the internet. The internet and and what's going to cause like a fracturing of your of your self worth and your identity um, in the context of what people view, what people expect, and what people like kind of raise up onto a pedestal for uh, a fame. Mm-hmm. Um, well, let, okay. let's set up the, the, the plot a little bit. Uh, it, it's basically people's lives sort of revolve around these Vine-like short films. Yeah. A, and their popularity depends on, you know, how many people like the short films that they put out. What are, what are they called again? I, I forget. I'm sorry. Flashes. 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 That's right. It's called Streaker. Right. Yeah. Streaker. And... and there, the, the plot develops over jealousy, over people who are getting maybe yeah. a little bit more. Well, the short version, the setup is like there's this uh, these two vlogger roommates, um, and one of them is kind of like the most popular vlogger on the site, so she's really doing well. And then suddenly, uh, a kind of rival vlogger of hers ends up getting cancer and becomes the most popular because of that. And so, um, you know, now now this. The, the one who used to be popular, her social status has been damaged by that. And it's just about like kind of how, what happens from there and how she, you know, she tackles that and then she starts getting stalked and um, that makes her popular again. And she's not that eager necessarily to stop the stalking because that's, you know, giving her fame, I guess. And then there's the, the subplot uh, of a contest put on by Toot Strudels. Yes, <laughs> which well, is one of my yeah, favorite inventions of in film this year is Toot Strudels. Yeah, uh, the sponsor Streaker, the website is uh, is primarily sponsored during the, this particular season by um, the radioactive toaster pastry Toot Strudels. <laughs> and um, so, you know, as part of that, they do a, a competition to make like the best Toot Strudels uh, commercial, essentially. Yeah. Which like it's straight up like Doritos does it every year yeah. for the Super Bowl. They're like make a make us a free commercial for Doritos. It's like very obnoxious, but um, I kind of like developed uh, as we were doing the as we were shooting and as we we're in post the whole Toot Strudels mythology continued to develop. Um, <laughs> I, I love of- the phrase Toot Strudels mythology. <laughs> <laughs> It, you know, we wanted the film because part of it is like the idea that essentially, you know, you're like these people's lives are being ruined by all this crap that they do on the Internet. And um, it's essentially all in service of selling some really dumb product. I mean, like the, at the end of the day, you have to be selling something, right? Somebody's making money on something. That's the only reason these sites exist. So we kind of thought about what is the dumbest possible thing. <laughs> and it ended up being uh, you know, toaster pastries was the dumbest possible thing. I also like personally just really love commercials and films like uh, like Total Recall. Or, Robocop. Like, yeah. Mandy has a great commercial in oh, yeah. it. Um, Sorry to bother you has awesome like commercials in it. So it's just like it's like an element to film that I always really enjoy. Well, there are a lot of uh, humor anthologies like uh, Amazon Women on the Moon. Oh yeah, yeah. It ha- has uh, a couple of great ones. Um, well, what were the um, Hollywood Shuffle? Robert Townsend's brilliant and underappreciated anthology sketch anthology. Well, that's tough. Maybe that's that's kind of a sketch anthology, but it does have a pretty strong wraparound to it as well. So yeah, the, the, I I enjoy that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like a nice tradition to fall into. Yeah, we also, I mean, one of the things that we thought was interesting and that we, like Sophia said, we kind of grew it as we went, is that we had some more, like, scenes of character development of some of the secondary characters and decided to cut a lot of that out in favor of just, like, condensing it down to, like, we're going to convey everything we need to convey about these characters in their, like, one-minute video that they make um, about Toot Strudels. <laughs> yeah, yes, I, and I, I enjoyed all of the commercials, and I, I enjoy the fact, I don't know exactly why it was done this way, I enjoy the fact that the warning starts out incomprehensible, and, yeah. and the first one, and slowly, until you get to the, to the last one, it slows down with each one until you finally understand the <laughs> warning about, what what is the what is the warning, again, about the... Uh, uh, well, it's a it's a disclaimer because yes. it's, the the slogan for Toot Strills is there's fruit in every toot. <laughs> um, right. But the disclaimer is that uh, is that no fruit contains no. <laughs> I got to get the exact wording. Sorry. <laughs> since since it's uh, fruit contains no flavors, colors, pulp, or other natural derivatives of fruits or vegetables. Um, 
so uh, you know, it's kind of like those uh, medical commercial side effects may include whatever. But um, I, I, for me, like, I wanted the end to be like we're we're actually in reality. We're telling the truth finally. So like everything <laughs> right. is obscured, you know, throughout the film. So it's like there's fruit in every tooth, but there's no actual fruit in the thing. You know, like that's mm-hmm. the that's like the idea. Like everything is bullshit. That's that's kind of the premise. I mean, if there's a thesis of the film, it's that everything is bullshit. Right, that that sort of mirrors the development of the plot. Yeah, that that exactly. it starts off, it kind of starts off as a comedy, and then be, then starts to uh, you start to get a few hallmarks of horror, and it becomes a horror movie. Then for a minute, every there's sort of a reveal where it's not a horror movie, and then it becomes a horror movie again. Yeah. <laughs> then, that's, that's accurate. <laughs> Would you? Do you think that's an accurate assessment of? of I think that's an accurate assessment. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, we, plus toot strudels. All of that plus toot strudels. You, I mean, you I, can't underestimate them. We always think we're starting out. We're like, this is going to be our normal mainstream movie. That's like totally. <laughs> that's not Michael, I'm like, it'll be like a make something very mainstream now. Everybody will understand it. It'll be it'll be sensible. Like we'll do. And then as time goes on, it gets gradually and gradually more more ridiculous. Um, this is like the, the path of every film we make. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's, you know, we're really interested in like the subtextual like layering and we're really interested in the parallels between the different elements and we're, you know, so we get caught up in like a lot of that stuff. And like, so we really wanted, uh, everything to be about like what portrayal of yourself, what your identity is on the internet is like. And a lot of that is like, you know, you're there's a real what's real, what's not real, what, you know, how what what impositions are there on you? Why do you make the choices to portray yourself the way you portray yourself? Um, so anyway, all those things are kind it's of a part of it. It's like, you know, one of my my uh, spots in the movie where I think we really hone in part of the message is like the lead Bailey is very intelligent, but she presents herself as kind of like the ditzy, likable blonde, you know, or on online. But it's also calculated because she's like, this is what's going to get me success. It's not college. It's not, you know, becoming a doctor or something. It's through this website and through Internet fame. And so it's like a choice that she makes about her future to do that, um, which I find is interesting. And I think it is a thing that, like, people have to think about now or, like, it's a, it is like a path that people try to choose. I don't think it's open to everybody. Well, there's <laughs> a conversation that she has with uh, her roommate in the van about that. Uh, yeah, exactly. that, that reveals that I'm, I'm forgetting. I'm sorry. I'm working without my notes Definitely. for this, but that, but I remember that. Yeah. What was the, uh, what was the through line of that conversation again? Uh, you're talking about outside the convenience store where they're, t- where, the, where she just, she basically reveals that she knows she's really smart and knows biology. Is that the, the part where you're. Yeah. Right? And, and she said, well, and her roommate yeah, says, well, why don't you ever show this? And, and yeah, she's basically like, nobody cares. They just, they just want to see me making makeup tutorials and interviewing Hollywood's weirdest. That's, you know, that's all people are interested in. And, um, and like, that's the path to success, basically. I mean, that's the, you know, the premise there is that, like, she's just like, well, I just, I have studied this. I've identified what the thing to do is. I don't care about it. It's not, I mean, we purposely actually, because um, a lot of these movies that are about internet or about vlogging or something, they, there's a lot of videos of the people vlogging. And we were like, we just want to have as few videos of her actually vlogging as possible. So we only did the one. And we wanted it to be kind of like mundane and and stupid, like not really anything interesting at all. And um, and that's sort of the point is that, you know, she just does this thing because it's like this is what I've studied and figured out is the path to popularity. Right. And it's working for her. Like her teachers don't care about her grades because her teachers are fans of her. Like the neighbors are fans. Like it's definitely a thing that like she is seeing success with. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, it would have been really easy to because she's kind of a a villain in a way to make her a caricature and to make her something sort of vapid and, and, uh, and unlikable and, and stupid because in some sense the, the audience for parts of this film aren't supposed to like her very much. Yeah. Yeah. She asked us to the uh, Amanda who the uh, played the part, she was like, 
can we make sure that people like this character? Like she's like she was worried about that, and um, and you know we we were very very much our goal. Like as you, as you said, very much our goal is to open where you're like, what is wrong with this person? Like this is the most vapid, terrible person ever, and then to have you start to like understand and realize that like she's just she's just following a path and this is a path that's kind of imposed on her almost it's not right. even that she's you know she's not even necessarily doing this because she chooses this or believes in it but it's because this is like just it's just what has been imposed on young people they don't really have uh other ways to be successful i mean and we think about this all the time as you know filmmakers or even when we're doing music so much uh social media is involved in all that stuff and especially if you're in acting or anything like that you have to be like all they care about is how many Instagram followers you have, you know, and she, so she is a real person, Amanda, who would play the role. Uh, I think she could really relate to the character. She's also very smart. And um, I don't know that she does all the vapid stuff as much, but, but uh, you know, she's a very smart person. I think she just ha has to, you know, she identifies that she, what she is going to be selling is not necessarily, you know, intelligence or something like that. I think it's really important for me too when I came to the script and the story is to make it as like feminist as possible still even though like like you say they are kind of villains um, and I didn't want it to be like oh millennials are so dumb and stupid and you know because like, that's not the case either because we're as much involved in this culture as anybody else like mm -hmm. we're carefully crafting our online presence and like you know putting out posts and stuff so it's like we're all complicit I think that's part of the movie is like you as the viewer, because you're viewing it, is complicit, and you know all of us on the outside, because we're all doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. And I did enjoy. There is a. a I, it must be a purposeful homage to Halloween in the uh, the mask. Absolutely, yeah. It was funny too because, um, you know, we were just kind of brainstorming and we we're like, well, what's you know, it like was almost important at first, like what's the mask going to be? And I was like, well, the most terrifying thing is going to be a Trump mask. And so then we, you know, we spray painted it white and then it was even more terrifying. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, but it ended up being like a really interesting subtext to me because like he is the, the biggest way that celebrity has turned into power mm -hmm. uh, in, in our lifetime, for sure, going, you know, from reality TV and now he's like a president, you know, and so it's like, that is like the biggest, you know, um, example of this going wrong. <laughs> uh. And, um, you know, so it's, it's just, uh, it ended up being like an interesting yeah. addition to it. It's not really, so it's not really like, because people have asked this a lot, uh, it's not really a movie about Trump as the villain, because they're like, oh, is this like a, I mean, I, we're not fans of Trump, I don't think that that's a surprise to anybody, but but um, it's really more about like the the idea that Trump is like a force, like just the way, you know, Michael Myers in Halloween, uh, you know, it's described as the shape, like it's not really supposed to be a human, it's supposed to be this like entity, this force, and they explore that a lot later in the later Halloween movies, mm -hmm. but uh, for us, like Trump is just like a, a representation of that like weird celebrity out of control um and it's not he's like not even really a person and people don't even i mean i don't even know if he's a person anymore we don't even really think of him as a human we just think of him as this like mm -hmm. force and, and if you're on one side you pretty much think of him as a force of evil and if you think on the other side you think of him as like a force of like greatness or something i don't know but um we really wanted it to be like this this the the same idea is like a kind of a, a capture some of that like that entity kind of idea rather than just like a mm. you know mask of a person I guess. Well, it does make it some make him somewhat unrecognizable to to paint him white in the same way that I didn't know for years that was a Shatner mask, the a William yep, Shatner yeah. mask on, on Halloween. I felt stupid when I read that it was and I, I saw it immediately. But he, you know. Does everybody recognize that the, the, that mask is Trump? Right they now? have so far, yeah, because I was we were curious about that. I mean, we have a literal moment in the movie with the Trump mask, so I think maybe that helps. Right. Yeah. Uh, so maybe that helps. But yeah, no, I I took like when I, when the first few people saw it, I was like, okay, I have some survey questions for you. Like, did you know what was happening here? Did you you know like, and uh, everybody knew it was a Trump mask. Uh, that I have talked to, mm -hmm. I could easily see someone not knowing though. Like you said, like it could, you know, it could easily go over someone's head. Mm -hmm. um, we weren't sure uh, when making the movie whether it would, but I think. 
Well, we got one where he's making a very ridiculous face, too. Uh-huh. <laughs> Lips are really pursed. So even like the mask before we painted it white was like a weird, like it looked kind of weird. weird Trump anyway. mask, yeah. Yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> well, I definitely got that it was Trump. I don't know that the that I don't know that I got it the very second I saw it. Yeah. Yeah. Which is probably okay. Uh-huh. You know, <laughs> probably. <laughs> I mean, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a it pretty... may indicate a terrible problem, but <laughs> no, it, it's 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 actually fine. I mean, if you don't, yeah. it, it's just a. I mean, it's just another layer to the movie. It doesn't really, like uh, like you see, it doesn't necessarily matter, but I think it is, uh, yeah. it has meaning. Contextually, the, it has yeah. a lot of meaning. Yeah. Well, and that, yeah. that's, uh, you've said in the in the past that you sort of need subtext for a movie. You, that you can't necessarily enjoy a movie without it, or, or, or maybe the distinction is you don't think it's a very good movie if it doesn't have yeah. some sort yeah. of yeah. subtext. Yeah. I need, a, I need a meaning. I need a moral meaning at the end of a movie. And yeah. I think it's because maybe um, my favorite things growing up was sci-fi, and that always had like it's all sci-fi is just subtext. Like it's like always has a point to make or something to say. So to me, it's like if we're making a movie, like what are we saying, you know? Or like if I'm watching a movie, like I get to the end, I'm like, okay, so what's it about? <laughs> uh-huh. and if it doesn't have something interesting to say or something like. I yeah. can take home. I'm, I'm not that interested. I mean, I accept movies that are the, that we watch like that are just about I mean, sure, chewing popcorn and watching fun, it, but but you know, but, but we're not that interested in making. But that's it. not going to be one of my favorite mm-hmm. movies. You know, it's going to be a movie I had fun watching. Yeah, and that this movie is very different from. I think it is, anyways. Maybe you wouldn't agree, but it's different from Ten. It's different uh, from Magnetic. Uh, it's different from Blood of the Tribids. Again, do am I saying Tribids right again? Yep. I, I could, okay. I think I uh, sometimes I get stuck on the wrong one, thinking it's the thinking yeah. I've corrected myself. But it's a it's a it feels like a much different movie to me in terms of of style and narrative from the mm-hmm. from the other three movies. Are you pers- are you uh, specifically trying not to repeat yourself uh, to to do something that you haven't done before with each successive movie? I think so. I think, uh, you know, people always ask us, like, are we going to do a sequel or something to any of those movies? And we're like, why? <laughs> you know, like, I mean, if somebody wants to give me money, sure. But um, I think it's interesting because this is our first film that's not a period piece. So we had to create the whole world in reality, sort of. You know, it's like, it's very uh, surreal, of course, but mm-hmm. it's present day. So that was an interesting, not, I mean, challenge is a weird word because it's like, you don't have to worry as much about costuming or whatever. You know? Right. Um, but that was new. And so I think with each film, we kind of try to identify, like, what kind of movie are we trying to make? Like, is it, like, an 80s retro future, you know, movie, or is it present day? And then build what it is from there. And so it's just, you know, the movie, the narrative and the, and the style of movie just demanded something else from us. And um, Yeah, we don't want to make the same movie. No, over again. We it's, like, it's, like it's, we were saying earlier with horror just being this huge umbrella like and I like all sorts of different styles so you know it's just kind of natural that like now you know my brain my flight of fancy is taking me to this style so um, you know I definitely want to go back to more uh, like a 70s type horror movie sometime in the near future um, but it won't be like Tribbett you know it'll be a different kind of 70s movie so. mm-hmm. we definitely have a lot of consistent I would say consistent thematic yeah. threads that, that Especially go about, identity. about identity that's like our, our big thing but but no I think we we just don't want to make the same movie twice I mean why mm. bother why right. bother we already, we already made it once well, yeah. I mean I well, guess we could probably do it better now but. yeah no, for <laughs> sure that's clear in this too yeah. it's like our production value goes up each time for sure mm. you won't make um, like Evil Dead and Evil Dead 2 no, no. I mean, if somebody gave us more money, you know, I guess, yeah. like Sophia said, if somebody was like, here's a million dollars, make that movie again, I would not yeah, say no. But, um, but we're not, if we're, if we're just following like our interest, I don't think we're ever going to make two movies that are like really close together. Mm-hmm. You know, there's probably going to be thematic similarities. And I, I well, think like I definitely want to do more sci-fi and I definitely want to do more like 70s style. But again, I don't think anything I do would be that similar to like Magnetic mm-hmm. or Blood of the Tribbett. So it's, you know, it's just, I think, coming from loving all kinds of movies and then wanting to do like our own spin on things. Mm-hmm. And when can people uh, see Clickbait? I know it's not currently available. Yeah, this is a good question. We don't know the answer yet, but um, we do have a, we signed a distribution deal for it, 
and um, it's going to be out in sometime in the late spring or early summer. Um, so we're thinking maybe like May ish. Uh, we don't we don't decide any of this stuff. Somebody just hmm. someday they send us a message and they're like, or it'll just be online. And then no, I they'll tell it. us. <laughs> they'll be like, the release date is this day. You know, that's that's basically how it works. So we're just waiting on the um, the sales agent distributor to decide when they're going to release it but uh but yeah it's been looking like that and we're going to be doing a few more festivals in some of our favorite cities i can't tell you more than that yet but in some of our favorite cities uh in the coming months so mm-hmm. we'll be we'll play a few you know a few more and i'll have a few more festival screenings uh, before the release and, and you can't say what platforms just yet what platforms it'll be on well it'll be uh, i mean it's i we don't know for you know factually, but it'll be on uh, all the major VOD platforms, mm-hmm. and um, it'll, be it'll be on DVD at least. And we're working on a Blu-ray release. Um, so yeah, it should be. I mean, it'll it'll be all the normal places that you watch. I mean, it won't be on Netflix, I'm sure, mm-hmm. um, uh, but it should be on like Amazon and iTunes and Google Play and. God knows what else. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, I guess it could be on Netflix. We don't know, but I doubt it. I really doubt it. Mm-hmm. Where can you find the other films? Uh, all of our films. I mean, uh, Amazon is the safest one. If you go to our website, launchover.com, it has links to all the films. I think all of them are on Amazon at this point. Yeah. Um, and then they're, they're on various scattered platforms from there. You know, most of them are on the, again, on major platforms. They're all, they're all out on DVD. Blood of the Tribbids is out on Blu-ray, though we're almost out of it, and it will probably not be reprinted or go, you know, not be uh, re-released on Blu-ray. Um, is that because of the interesting Amazon reviews you've gotten? No, 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 just the cost. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, uh, it's uh, no, that's fine. We we yeah. laugh. We get fun fun reviews. Yeah, um, we started making T-shirts for anybody who's uh, who, who likes and two bad reviews. There are two Strudel T-shirts as well. <laughs> So those are all on Amazon. Um, but yeah, no, Blood of the Tribbles is actually getting a re-release this year as part of a series, kind of like, um, you know, Elvira does like the intros to horror films, uh-huh. that kind of thing. So um, we're, Blood of the Tribbles is getting a re-release uh, under a series that is called Malovia's Movie Matinee, I believe. Uh-huh. And... Um, Mal- Malvolia, sorry, I yeah, said the name wrong. Sure. Malvolia's movie matinee. Uh, so that'll be out again this year with uh, extra like intro and commentary and stuff. Um, yeah, and it, under the title, Lesbos Vampiros. Uh-huh. So we'll expect uh, lawsuits in the future. Um, and <laughs> As a tribute to your some of your inspiration for the film. Yes, yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. And I, it's looking like uh, we're getting the rights back. This is a very boring detail now but we're getting the rights back to magnetic as well this year and it's looking like we're we're in talks to do another release of that uh possibly retitling as well but it'll be it'll get a new fresh uh fresh release later this year as well i think yeah Mm. that one ended up being the hardest to get out into the universe and i think it's because it's not horror like being a very strange slow sci-fi movie it's like we didn't get as much of a push on it so i'm excited to try to like get it back out there because i think it's still fun Mm. movie and you worked on some other projects this year. Do you want to mention those and where you can find those? Sure. <laughs> what did we work on? We did a lot of well, we did a lot of anthologies. Um, right. For one thing. So those uh, include. Let's let me pull up the list. I remember uh, well. So this anthology called Taste of Phobia, that was put out by this company Art Exploitation. That's available on um, DVD and streaming and all that. And we did a segment called Somnophobia where I act in it and um, basically torture myself more or less. Mm-hmm. So that's that's fun if you want to see me suffering. <laughs> uh, we did a, a, a film called uh, F- uh, Operation Fist of God. Uh, that's about it's on a, a an anthology called Conspiracy X, which is all about uh, conspiracy theories and things that are, you know, made up mostly. But uh, ours is a conspiracy theory about how in the 80s the Soviets infiltrated uh, religious, sort of cons- conservative fundamentalists in America and uh, manipulated them to like bring down the U.S. government. 
So that's out on, uh, I think it's coming out on DVD soon, and it's currently, I think, only on Troma, mm-hmm. Troma streaming service, but it'll be out on other services later. We had uh, a film on uh, 60 Seconds to Die and 60 Seconds to Die 2, which are both out on DVD and um, streaming. We have a segment on a, a anthology called To Die For that's also out on DVD and streaming. Um, and I think those are the big ones. Yeah, the Alton of Doom is coming out soon, right? Yeah, Tales we've got we've got a there's an anthology called Tales from the Grave, which is kind of like a 70s. The idea is to do 70s TV sort of style Ours horror. Is about a satanic telephone. Ours is about <laughs> a satanic telephone. It's called Dial Tone of Doom. <laughs> so and, and, soon. <laughs> and you can yep. find out uh, about all of these things on uh, launchover.com. Launchover.com, MikeAndSophia.com, or our names, uh, SophiaCassiola.com, MichaelJEpstein.com, uh, and we're on social media and all that nonsense as well. So, yeah. And um, you're, you're currently... Bob- oh, I'm sorry. No, no, what, what, what were you going to say? I was going to say, uh, and you're currently looking for uh, a new script to work on? Uh, well, I think we have... We're, We've been back and forth about what to do next. We have three films in contention for making I think at the moment mm-hmm. we have a lot of films in development um, we actually have a lot about our films that are in development on launchover.com if people are interested but um, we've got like three films that are in contention for making uh, I think we're going to be shooting one in March a really kind of low key one and then we're hoping to do maybe another one later in the year we'll see about money and other various factors mm-hmm. that are involved in filmmaking we're at the point where we're trying to chase like not even big budgets but like slightly more money than our credit card can handle Uh (laughs) and uh so it's like a little bit of that like trying to find some investors for some of our scripts that like maybe need a little bit more budget um but in the meantime keep working on stuff that we can just do like basically the two of us so Mm -hmm. it's kind of like a game of like we don't want to wait the 10 years it might take to get a decent budget we want to keep working, so. so yeah, and we're waiting, you know, because like, Clickbait won't be out till later this year, and then we're waiting on returns on that to make the like next one. So it's you know, it's a, it's a whole yeah. whole cycle of money going in and out. So. Yeah. <laughs> so I wanted to end with this. You guys have been watching or trying to watch at least a different movie every day this year, correct? Yeah, at least. At least one movie per day. <laughs> So yeah. I wanted to end with this. I wanted to see if you guys had one or two recommendations each from the movies you've watched this year. So this is not not I'm movies great. that are new. Basically, it could be anything. Yeah, any of the movies you've watched as part of that project this year. Because I know you've oh. been going back and forth. It's all been uh, – it's uh, anything's up for grabs. Yeah. Um, Don't Look Now. Did we say that in the theater this year? Yeah, yeah, we did. We did. Um, Nicholas Rogue, who just passed away. I think that's an incredible movie. It's uh, Donald Sutherland. And who's the woman? Uh, Julie Christie. Julie Christie, right? It's an insane, very, like, Italian-inspired, I would say. It takes place in Venice. Um, You know, dealing with grief over losing a child. Mm -hmm. Crazy stuff. It has, like, the best intimate scene ever, I would say. Intercut. Uh, marriage things have it's so good so I would say if you don't look now um, especially since you just passed it's like a you know it's always nice to revisit films mm-hmm. uh, I'll pick a I'll pick like a weird schlocky one just for fun because I thought <laughs> this was a fun movie it's not I don't know if it's a, a great you know great cinema or anything but a movie from 1989 called Intruder that I had not was not familiar with at all before, and it's about uh, a um, a bunch of people working in a grocery store, like a convenience grocery store, a small grocery store, hmm. and um, they start getting killed off. And uh, it has just a lot of amazing humor in it, really good practical effects. It was made for like no money, and Sam Raimi was involved, and and uh, I think he produced it maybe. Mm-hmm. And so Sam Raimi and Bruce Campbell and um, and uh, a bunch of people from that you know kind of world show up with cameos in it and it's just a really fun interesting movie and it has my I, it's hard to talk about without spoiling it but there's a part where this guy um uses a severed head in an interesting way and it's like <laughs> one of my favorite moments in in film ever i would say where can people see that i think it's just you know streaming everywhere it's like probably amazon and other places i think i saw it on the uh 
Full Moon, the company. I'm uh, subscribed to their streaming service. I saw it there, but I but I think it's everywhere. Oh All yeah, the true- they've got some interesting stuff on that that streaming. Very bizarre, service. yeah, very bizarre stuff. So yeah, so that's a fun one. Um, do you have any? Uh, we just watched Blowout, which I'd never seen oh, yeah. before. Which um, it's really interesting movie right now, I think. I mean, John Travolta is, like, not great actor, but all of his weird quirks and things in it really work really well. And it's really fascinating, like, focusing on audio again, like, you know, Quiet Place or something. But, like, focusing on, like, a sound guy and the audio he captures that proves a conspiracy is happening. Um, so, like, the government conspiracy stuff is interesting. The filmmaking side of it is interesting. So it's a very cool De Palma movie. Mm-hmm. Uh, I got a I got a pair of movies if you're if you're interested in another another quick round. Sure. Um, there's a pair of movies called Death Walks at Midnight and Death Walks in High Heels, 1971 and 1972, um, made by Luciano Ercoli, so Italian films, mm-hmm. and uh, they're just great like great great early giallo films. They have almost all the same cast. It's made the same filmmaker. They're made a year apart. Um, they star this woman named Susan Scott, uh, who, uh, I think is a good, you know, interesting giallo kind of, you know, final, final girl, if you will. Um, but it's interesting cause they're, they're both, uh, great giallo films and it's just like, they took the same group of people, they made one and they're like, let's make another one. And they're not, the characters aren't the same, but it's all the same actors. Mm-hmm. So if you're into the early giallo stuff, death walks at midnight, death walks in high heels. We love all that early, like 1970 to like 1977 or so, like Giallo stuff is really a, our our favorite era of stuff, I would say. Mm-hmm. One more, I think the weirdest movie I've seen in a long time, <laughs> the most WTF, is called The Swarm, and it's from 1978 and starring Michael Caine, and it's about killer bees. <laughs> uh, that can't be the only movie about killer bees. I know I've seen a, a couple. Probably. Um, it's also like weirdly like an environmental film, like we're like ruining the environment and the bees. <laughs> it's like four hours long. It's super long. It's very <laughs> boring, um, but it's just so weird. <laughs> Did you say it's very boring? Is that what you said? Yeah, it's so boring. Like it's like the generals talking. Michael Caine's like a science, a very sweaty scientist, <laughs> and, like, and the generals are disagreeing with them, and like a nuclear power plant explodes. Like somehow. It's, like, not very good, but it's so, like, what is going on here? <laughs> uh, How did this get made? It obviously had a large budget. I think it won, like, an Academy Award for, like, props or something. Uh, that design. It's just very strange. It's on Amazon. Um, but, yeah, that was maybe the weirdest movie I've seen in a very long time. Boring but oddly compelling in some way. Yeah, like, I had to finish it. But, yeah, it's two hours and 35 minutes. <laughs> no reason killer <laughs> be that long it's such a bizarre movie yeah it's maybe this is one of the weirdest movies i've ever seen but it's like it had a weird environmental bent which i think is like the takeaway who even knows what it was trying to do yeah but michael Caine, man he, he definitely took some paychecks <laughs> I, th- I feel like there's a lot of those movies where where nature runs wild where there are giant ants or giant bugs of some sort or something fall back on that it's because we're ruining the environment and they don't really care necessarily yeah, that yeah. we're ruining the environment. That's just the, the sort of plot point. Convenient. I think my favorite one is—is is it called Nightwing? Nightwing. That I've seen. Um, I don't know how easy it is to find because it's not really it out. Yeah. Millimeter, but it's who's that actor? David Warner. Do you he know always, David Warner? He's like the same crazy guy, British guy. I feel Are you like familiar I with him? I, I feel like I do. Yeah, you know, like him. Um, so David Warner. Can I can I well, talk it's about, about vampire bats? It's, it, it's about vam- vampire bats, and David Warner is a vampire bat hunter. He's dedicated his life. <laughs> oh, I'm looking at him now. Yeah, I know him. Destroying vampire bats, and he gives us the the guy's like, "Why did you dedicate your life to destroying vampire bats?" And he gives us a great speech that's just like, "All the creatures of the earth have a purpose. They all contribute something except for one, the vampire bat." And then he goes on this like long rant about how they're like they're. <laughs> The, the cave smells like because they they're they're. But also have all this crazy stuff like they're in the mid the mid, Midwest, right? Southwest. Southwest. Oh, where what? there's like what? Indian reservations and like, you know, oil drilling is happening that disrupts the vampire bats and like there's like all these Native Americans doing things. It's like so bizarre. It's a very bizarre movie. Well, why does David Warner get to decide which is the one creature on Earth that has no purpose? <laughs> 
Uh, what, what's his, what's his I mean, is he a scientist or is he just, you no, know? He, he's a scientist, yeah. He okay. says it as, as if it's objective truth, that <laughs> all that all other creatures contribute to, like, the ecosystem, but, like, vampire bats are just, like, parasitic. Like, they just, they uh-huh. just consume and destroy stuff. Um, it's a very bizarre, it's, incredible film. it's a very bizarre thing. Um, he just sounds like drunk uncle. Yeah. yeah. You know Jim, what? The one creature that's useless is the vampire bat. Basically accurate. Yeah, that's basically it. Yeah. It's an incredible <laughs> film. If you ever get a chance to see it, it's an incredible film. It's not a good film, but it's an incredible film. <laughs> I like uh, that. I like that, that, that you can put those things together. The cognitive dissonance yeah. of that, the, the, uh, dialectic nature uh, of criticism. Did you ever see the movie time after time? Yes, uh, but I, but a long time ago. Yeah, because he plays Jack the Ripper in that, um, and Malcolm McDowell is the good is H. Uh, G. Wells, I guess, right? Who's hunting him? So he's David Warner is in a lot of great roles. Is all I'm trying to say here. <laughs> Jack the Ripper, the guy who hunts vampire bats, he's, he does a lot of good stuff. I'm wondering. Uh, I'm checking this now, and I've, I know we're sort of getting past, we're way past time. But now that I've looked at him, I feel like he was possibly in The Man with Two Brains as well. That's totally plausible. I may be confusing him for somebody else, but he might have been Dr. Necessitor in that. I'll have to check. Somebody, look, yeah. I'll see if the, we'll see if we get letters. It but, is. Uh, yep, I just checked it. That is him? He is Dr. Necessitor, yeah. He yep. Yes. Yep. yep. He's a very prolific actor. Yep. Wow. He's in Mary Poppins Returns, apparently. Wow. So I haven't still, seen that yet, but still working. Still working. <laughs> Another movie that that's a, a horror movie that people yeah, don't. Yeah, definitely think. a horror movie. I haven't <laughs> yes. seen it yet. But I hear it is kind of a horror movie. There's some guy in okay. your chimney. Yeah. <laughs> All right, well, thank you guys very much uh, for spending so much time with me to to talk about the uh, the year in horror and about yeah, clickbait. I, I really appreciate it, and thanks for your patience again. I know this got delayed a bunch of times. Thanks for uh, having yeah, us, and uh, we enjoyed we enjoyed uh, chatting. An arrow to the head isn't always a trick. Thanks once again to Michael J. Epstein and Sophia Cassiola for this monster episode of the podcast. Clickbait is making the rounds on the festival circuit and will be out later in the spring or summer of 2019 on Video On Demand. You can keep up with that and Mike and Sophia's various other projects on their website at launchover.com and on Facebook and on Twitter at at launchover. You can also find movie posters and the clickbait trailer, as well as essays, reviews, and other episodes of the podcast on the Department of Tangents website at www.departmentoftangents.com. And if you enjoyed this episode or any other episode, please consider giving us a review or rating on iTunes or Stitcher or wherever you get your podcasts. You can also keep up with us on Facebook and Twitter. And now, our featured track, Alone, from Whispering Sons, a post-punk outfit from Brussels, Belgium. It's from their first full-length album, Image, which they recorded after moving to the big city as a group. That accounts in part for the recurring theme of feeling out of step with your surroundings. One of the refrains here is, They move so slowly when they're not afraid, and I just keep moving at a different rate. It's a kind of stillness I can't relate. Juxtapose that with the moving pulse of the bass and drums and the stuttering, glassy-sounding guitar. The press materials mention the music is for fans of The Damned and Joy Division, and that's applicable, but frontwoman Fenny Coupin's glowering low-register vocals remind me a bit of Nick Cave. See what you think. This is Alone from Whispering Sons. Happy New Year, everyone, and see you again soon.